My name is Dustin Kelly, but everybody calls me DJ. I'm prior Army, serving as both a Ford Observer and a military police officer. I spent the last 14 and a half years as a police officer and detective in a large metropolitan police department. Two things that I've learned throughout my career. One, everybody has a story to tell. And two, the best stories are true. This is the DTD Podcast. In three, two, one, and we're live. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the DTD Studios. This week in the studio, I'm proud to introduce a man with almost 38 years of service to this country. My guest started his service as a lowly private and ended that service as the highest ranking enlisted personnel in the U.S. military. My guest has five combat tours that started with Operation Just Cause and continuing up into and through the GWAT. He has been deployed to countries such as Iraq, Afghanistan, Panama, Syria, Somalia, and Yemen. My guest served as a senior enlisted advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and is the only guest of this show to ever quote House of Pain in his fantastic biography, Surrender or Die. He has given every fiber of his being to this country in order to see that the soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines that are charged with this country's protection are taken care of physically, mentally, and emotionally. Please welcome the founder of the E-Tool Nation and PME Hard, John Wayne Troxel. What's going on, my friend? DJ, it's an honor to be here, brother. Thanks so much for having me, and I am excited to, for the conversation today. Like I said before, 38 years. There's so much to talk about in that time frame. I mean, that's some people's double and triple their lives of what they've done. And you look at everything that happened with you, and it's just an amazing story to fit all into one book. Now, the first question that I have about the book, though, that I had while I was reading it, the first part of the book seems very sterile. It seems very uh, about your career. These are the facts. This is what happened. Let me present it to you like this. And then you get to the second half of the book, and you really peel off the Band-Aid, and you let everybody know, no matter what rank you are, no matter where you are in the world, bad things can happen to you, and you better be prepared for them, and you better have a plan of action on the other side of it. So let's start with why the book was written in that since you know first of all people after my career you know and i retired people kept saying hey you need to write a book you need to write a book you know and and the reason they wanted me to write a book is because of all the good and bad you know becoming the SEAC uh for one parachuting into combat and just cause and serving five combat tours but also being suspended as the SEAC and then you know what combat does to our service members and veterans and also the invisible wounds of war. So in in terms of telling my story, I wanted to make sure anybody could read my book and understand. So first of all, they had to understand me as the person, John Wayne Troxel, you know, chapter one, you know, how I grew up. And then chapter two, just a chronological order of my career. And then after that, I wanted to get into, you know, why PME hard, why E-Tool Nation, becoming the SEAC, and then getting after, combat and and the invisible wounds of war from combat. And then the suspension was one that I wanted to dedicate a chapter to it when I was the SEAC and was on the bench for six months, you know, talking about military families in chapter nine, showcasing my spouse who, you know, in September will celebrate our 40th wedding anniversary. And uh, and then chapter 10 gives some leadership nuggets that I've kind of used throughout my career and my life. Uh, to continue to push forward and and get after business. So I wanted to show that there was good, there's bad, there's ugly, and there's chaotic in a military career. And certainly spending 38 years, uh, I saw it all. Yeah. And and like I said, when you read the first part and you kind of look through the list of assignments and stuff, other than one thing that I can think of that you talk about in there, it seems like a pretty charmed life uh, as you look through it. You know, oh, hey, we moved here and hey, we moved here and we did this and I was excited about this. And then you, like I said, kind of peel back those layers. And the first layer that I want to start with, you did it in the first chapter, but I think it paid off dividends at the back of this story. 
I want to talk about your family growing up. Now, yeah. your mother, Carolyn, and your father, Wayne, the way you describe it is your father made some mistakes and went to prison. Your mom divorced him, and you were kind of a single family for a while. And then this guy, Pop, Ben a McDonald, comes into your life. And that's the first inkling reading this story where you show true emotion when you talk about this man. I mean, more than when you talk about your mother, more than when you talk about your siblings, when you mention this man, the entire tone changes. You know, my, my biological father, I was very small. You know, I remembered him when I was, you know, a toddler and everything. But, uh, but I just remember, you know, he was doing things that uh, were unusual. Like, you know, we would have cartons full of stuff that would come to the house and, and would end up in the garage and everything. And, and so, and then all of a sudden he went away and, and uh, you know, he went to prison. And so then, you know, my mom divorced him. And so for a while there being, you know, a single parent raising all four of us kids, it was pretty interesting, you know, that, you know, if I would get a dollar on my birthday as a birthday present, I thought I was rich, you know, and everything. And, and uh, we were living, you know, what we would call in the military kind of a Spartan life. But then my stepfather came in, Ben McDonald, and all of a sudden he brought what, especially me and my brother, you know, I was the baby, my brother a year older than me, Tommy, we really needed, which was structure and a father figure in the house. And when he came in, he, he was the one that instilled discipline in us and made us, uh, you know, start understanding that we got to get ready for the world and everything and he uh he just you know um he was harsh, but he was fair um and uh, and i learned so much from him and i didn't realize how much uh that he and i were close until i joined the army and i went away to basic training and that day you know and i wrote about it in the book you know he he was very emotional which caused me to be emotional you know and he was afraid that uh you know, we were going to be in a war before long. And, and, you know, lo and behold, it was a few years later that I ended up parachuting into combat in Operation Just Call. But he was the guy that was truly the one that molded me into what I could be as a man. And, uh, and, and as I joined the military and I knew, you know, I had to do something at home. You know, I write about it in the first chapter. I was a, you know, kind of a juvenile delinquent of sorts, you know, and did a lot of fighting and drinking and stuff like that and not having a care in the world. And, and then all of a sudden one night in jail and the thing that I feared the most about being in jail was that my pop would find out. And then, uh, and then I would really get the wrath of Ben McDonald. But as I write about in the book, we were, my brother Tommy and along with his girlfriend were able to, <laughs> you know, get us covered on bail and everything. And, and thankfully the charges of malicious wounding got dumbed down because the guys wouldn't, press charges and ended up being disorderly conduct. So uh, pay the fine and everything was done. But that taught me the lesson uh, to move forward there. But to this day, my my pop was always the guy that, uh, you know, I looked up to. And then when I got selected to be the SEAC and, you know, called home with the news and everything, you know, and it, it was all over the, uh, the media and everything and it, just how proud he was you know, and, and we had a, a nice emotional moment together then. And, uh, you know, it was shortly after I took over as the SEAC in 2016 that he ended up passing away. And uh, clearly it was a void, you know, once he was gone. But uh, he was just a guy that, you know, brought our family together. He brought the level of synergy that we need to grow as a family. And were it weren't for him, I don't think I would have had the success I did in the military because I didn't have a father figure there to, to kind of coach me along and everything because my dad was in prison. So he, he has a special place in my heart and he will always be pop the guy that uh, molded me into what I became. Well, I think the way you describe it in the book is your loving home became wholesome once he got there. Yes, absolutely. And, and so when you talk about him, it, it makes me wonder and it makes me think back when you talk about your biological father and, and being very young when he went to prison, I'm sure there's not a lot that you can take from him. But I want to give you kind of a compare and contrast question. I want to know what you take from your biological father in being a father now, 
being a SAR major, being a leader in the military, and then what you take from pop and how you molded those things together. Because I think even though your father left very young, your biological father left very young, there still had to be some stuff that's in your brain going, maybe I don't do that instead of I should always do this. So can we talk about how you kind of melded those two men together to become the man you were and then how that changed over into your leadership, being a father, being a husband. Just as a, a thought, you know, I just reconnected with my biological father after 13 years. Sporadically, ever since uh, I was a kid, you know, I've kind of, uh, you know, we've kind of met and stuff. And, and uh, in 2010, my youngest brother on his side passed away. And so I went to the funeral and I saw him there. And before that, he came to Fort Bragg to visit in 1989, but unfortunately I was in Panama fighting. So he got to spend time with Sandra and the kids, but I never saw him, but I just reconnected with him. And to this day, and, and what I remember as a kid and what I've taken from him is he was always positive and he was always focused on, you know, moving forward. Even when he was, you know, doing things that were breaking, in the law and he ended up in prison you know when i met with him you know a month and a half ago you know here's a guy almost 80 years old and and i said to him i you know dad you're getting around pretty good and everything man he goes that's right i'm shooting for a hundred he said you know it, it was <laughs> it was so refreshing to hear someone that's almost 80 years old say hey i'm shooting for a hundred years old of life and i thought that's the kind of attitude so his uh, uh his positive thinking and his resiliency through everything he's been through in his life is something I can take. With Pop, it was living life with honor and being honorable in everything you do and treating people with dignity and respect and respecting authority, respecting the law, while you can to be able to do the things that you can in the United States of America. I think the biggest thing I took from Pop was that to live a life of honor and uh and, and, and so that's that's kind of the, the compare and contrast, you know. But it's funny when you talk about your father and you say, hey, I'm shooting for 100. That sounds exactly like you in this book. I mean, like the spitting <laughs> image of you. Let's get after this. Let's do this. Let's make this yeah. last. Let's make this better. And then with the honor part, I, I and of course we'll talk about it later on, but you can tell that I think your honor and – I guess it would be tied to your reputation, really took a shot when they put you on the sideline for six months. Yeah, absolutely. You know, first of all, I had done things in the past, you know, I was always a guy that, you know, you had to be genuine, you have to be authentic. And, and I, I thought to myself, if I wasn't genuine and authentic, then I was being hypocritical. And, you know, one of the things that always drove me was authentic leaders. And when someone was uh, trying to be something that they weren't, you know, and they were in charge of me. It was hard for me to follow them or hard for me to respect them. Now, don't get me wrong. You know, I was a good soldier. I followed orders. But I always told myself, when I get to where I want to be, I'm going to be that genuine, authentic kind of leader. And I'm going to bring energy and enthusiasm in everything I do. And, you know, for almost all of my career, that's the kind of leader that got me to where I, I ended up being in the SEAC position. But I sensed, you know, I had great bosses in Marine General Joe Dunford and Secretary Jim Mattis, among other secretaries. And they all, that's the kind of leader they wanted me to be. But I sensed in the Pentagon, you know, all of a sudden, you know, the things that got us these jobs to get in the Pentagon, people didn't want me to be that way. And they wanted me to, they kind of wanted to tamp me down and everything. And I refused to do that because, you know, one of the things that General Dunford told me is, hey, I'll know if you're doing a good job, not by me, you know, checking up on you, but what the troops are telling me, you know, and if you are having an impact with the troops. So I knew then that I had to be inspirational in my approach. I had to be authentic and I had to deliver messages that were all about what we existed for. And that was to fight and win our nation's wars when you have troops in 169 countries around the world on any given day, 250,000 or more around the world in 169 countries, 
then your message has to be broad and it has to be understood by all, regardless of service. And so some of the Pentagon didn't like that, you know, and, and some of them were, you know, senior officers, some senior enlisted that thought, you know, I even had, uh, after I called out ISIS and told them they had two options, surrender or die. And if they didn't, <laughs> ultimately we would beat them to death with our entrenching tools. I had a flag officer and I talk about this in the book who came into my office and said, do you do realize that enlisted are meant to be seen and not heard? And I thought to myself, well, Admiral, we can all be some fighting MFers in here. All right. Okay. I didn't say it that way in the book because I wanted to be respectful. But the point being in all of this is right after I got suspended and I found out why I was under investigation, you know, I, about two or three days, I was feeling sorry for myself. Like, I can't believe this is happening to me and everything. But then after that, I realized in a hurry that the, the system, the, the IG was being weaponized against me because the person that filed a complaint against me never once did they approach me man to man and say, we've got a problem or I need to talk yet. There's something about you I don't like or anything. They didn't have the intestinal fortitude to face me face to face. So they weaponized an agency and did it under anonymous claims. And because of the position I was in, and there were others that, you know, wanted to kind of either get rid of me or they wanted to shut me down, that pushed for this suspension, you know. And so for six months, uh, I sat in a cubicle under suspension, you know. And But I told myself early on, and I went and told General Dunford, I said, there's two ways this is going to end, Chairman. Either you're going to reinstate me or you're going to fire me and tell me to retire. I'm not going to quit. And there, and there was a lot of people that thought that the minute Troxel came under suspension and everything that they thought I was going to pack it in. But DJ, I would have been a hypocrite to the troops if I would have quit. Here I am talking about, I know you're in you're Yemen, I know you're in Somalia, I know you're in Syria, and you're under harsh conditions, you're under dangerous conditions and everything, and hang in there and get after it, and not just survive in those, but thrive in it. And so I told myself, that's what I'm going to do here. And I am going to continue to push back because I was confident in the end that I was going to be back. You know, I knew that, you know, when, when the, the IG takes at that level, takes a fine tooth comb over you, nobody's perfect. And certainly I'm, I'm the least person that's perfect. And I knew something might come up that I, I can't account for. And that happened two minor offenses and everything, but it was none of the stuff that the that the the complaint was about, which is that I was hostile and toxic and used torturous language. You know, I didn't realize, DJ, that telling the enemy that we're going to kill him in, <laughs> by any means necessary is torturous language. And and uh, I hope that you know the the kind of rhetoric we go back and forth with China and Russia. I hope that all of a sudden, you know, the the Chinese and Russian troops, if if they start filing IG complaints. We don't, we start suspending people ourselves, you know, I say that facetiously, you know, but well, well you say it facetiously, but we're not far from that. Yeah. But anyway, so the point was, uh, yeah, this happened to me late in my career and, and, uh, you know, and I could have easily packed it in and just retired, you know, but, uh, I was going to fight back. And then when I was reinstated, the bottom line, I wasn't going to change my leadership style. I, now, what I did do is I was more cognizant of my inner circle because the person that filed the complaint against me was in my inner circle. He didn't let any of the other staff know what was going on or what he was doing. And he secretly went about building this against me, you know, and uh, and then filed the complaint anonymously, which I thought was a cowardly move. You know, so this person didn't have the intestinal fortitude to come see me face to face on anything or have anybody on his behalf come and tell me that there were problems. And then second of all, filed this complaint and still didn't have the intestinal fortitude to put their name on the complaint, a complete cowardly way of doing business. But I will tell you, DJ, there are some out there, even though I got reinstated and I finished off my last year plus as the SEAC, you know, and, and continued to push on, even though people were trying to, get rid of the, the SEAC position or trying to erode it down to somebody like the night watchman in the Pentagon. I refused to allow that to happen. And when I retired, 
that week of my retirement, I had a, a conference with all of the most senior enlisted of the U.S. forces. Plus, there were 34 SEACs from around the world that were there, that were there at my uh, retirement to include the Ukrainian SEAC, who is still to this day fighting in his homeland now. So the point being in all of this is, yeah, I, I mean, I, I made some mistakes. I got held accountable with a, a counseling statement and everything because of, uh, of two offenses that were, you know, substantiated. But the ones, the big ones, you know, the hostile, toxic environment and all that other stuff was dismissed. So I spent 20 years as a command sergeant major, and I never once changed my leadership style. Well, and, and that's my point. I want to put a pin kind of in that because I have a lot of questions about that investigation. But I want to go back to the beginning of your career. I don't think that you were always that kind of soldier. I got a very different reading of you when you were 3rd ACR, maybe the first tour in Germany. Um, 82nd is when you really kind of made that pivot point in your career. But I want you to think back. We just talked about all the SEAC stuff and, and how you approached it and you talk about being able to confront someone, talk about that. In the beginning yeah. of your career, do you think that's the kind of soldier you were, or do you think you grew into that person? Oh, I, I clearly grew into it. One thing I learned, and I write about it in the book, is things in the military came pretty easy to me. You know, I didn't realize how physically fit I was. You know, I scored a 292 on the APFT in, in basic training, and came in second in my entire troop in the PT event, you know, and uh, I made the, the commandant's list and everything, but I was still, you know, this wayward young kid. I still was immature until I started getting around people that had the kind of the military wasta, if you will. And I talk about Master Sergeant Kermit Garrett, you know, in 3rd ACR, a guy that in Vietnam was in a firefight where almost an entire platoon uh, was obliterated, and he went from E1 to staff sergeant in 12 months, you know, because of combat promotions and everything. And then that's when I started looking for mentorship. But the key thing, before I found trying to be a better soldier, what got me there was that, uh, you know, I met my wife, Sandra, you know, right a month after I got to Fort Bliss, <laughs> Texas. Yeah. And, uh, and you saw the story there, you know, on how I had to win her over, you know, even to the point of leaving my buddy Stokes uh, laying on the floor after he fell off the dance floor and everything, you know. But but the point being was, you know, all of a sudden we we're expecting our first child and we're married and now I have family responsibilities and I didn't know how to do anything else other than be a soldier. And I said, well, the best way for me to take care of my family is to be the best soldier that I can be. And that's kind of what started me on this journey, even though I was still, you know, I would say pretty naive and everything and didn't know the direction. And you said it best, even when I, I spent three years in Germany and, uh, you know, I was uh, the division soldier of the quarter and, and all this other stuff, Audie Murphy and all this, until I got to the 82nd Airborne Division and I saw that now I was in a pond full of piranha that uh, were focused, they were disciplined, they were proud, and they, they were at, at the cutting edge of everything. And I knew I had to up my game to be on that, you know? And I learned the hard way, you know, and I talk about that, falling out of the division run right when I got there and then getting the requisite scunion that comes with being a fallout, you know? But it started over the time, it changed me. And that's really when all of a sudden I said, I am going to continue to do this, to be the best that I can be, not just for my family now, but I know that I can do a lot of good things here in the military and I can give back. And all of a sudden, when I started leading other soldiers, I knew I had to be the best leader I could be. And because of the experiences I had in the past, like at the third ACR, where I didn't have authentic leaders, you know, these dumpy NCOs that, you know, were death before dismount on their, on their tanks and everything. And, and I said, hey, I, I'm going to be that leader of example because it was leaders of example that got me motivated to go out and want to do good things. So that's I think you're exactly right. I was on a path, but I wasn't on the the I was on a positive path, but I wasn't on the best path 
until I became a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division. And then that's what transformed me there. Well, and I even look at something like the 21st Replacement Detachment, if you remember back into Germany. The first night you're there, you're laying on your bunk, and you said you cried tears of unhappiness. And at a point in Germany, you had even talked about getting out of the military, uh, being done with it, going back and getting a job. And Sandra once again stepped in and, and helped you out. I think very much so it's a good thing that she stepped in there for the career that came afterwards. And then you get to brag, and it just seems like it takes off. Like you're the only thing bad that I saw was you fell out of the run, and then you were like, "Fuck that! I'm not going to ever do that again." Here's how we're going to take care of things, and and it was off to the races. So you know the whole twenty first replacement thing. So I went to airborne school because I was on assignment for Germany. I didn't want to go. Newly married. I've I've got a newborn son coming, and. I didn't want to go. So I thought, how can I stay here? So my friend Randy Bragg and I both volunteered for airborne school, thinking that, okay, we'll go graduate airborne school and then we'll get assigned to the 82nd Airborne Division. I mean, I'll still be stateside, but went and graduated airborne school and they said, you're still going to Germany. So at that time, three weeks before I left, right after I got back from jump school, my son Daniel was born. So now I'm a brand new father. Okay. And then, you know, Sandra gets out of the hospital and everything and and we're staying with Sandra's parents and things were moving fast. And then I had to go fly up to Iowa to say goodbye to my mom and and pop, you know, which was another emotional moment because now I'm getting ready to go by myself. And then I head to St. Louis to the airport to fly to Germany. We didn't have a lot of money at that time either, you know, so we weren't financially doing well because I was a young PFC. You know, I had a newborn baby and a brand new wife, and here I am flying overseas thousands of miles apart from them. And then when I get there, along with the heartbreak of graduating from jump school, being a proud, you know, fresh airborne graduate and not going to the 82nd Airborne Division, I got to go to Germany to a heavy mechanized unit. And so all of that kind of hit me at once when I got to 21st Replacement Detachment and there was nobody there that I knew. The NCOs that were there at the detachment, you know, were kind of some of the ones similar to some of the ones that I had in the third ACR, you know, <laughs> great Americans and everything, but not the examples that I were looking. So I was in a very unhappy state. And so that night, you know, when I laid down in that bunk, I didn't have my wife, I didn't have my newborn son, I was not gonna be a paratrooper. And I was thousands of miles away from home still an immature kid, even though, you know, I'm, I'm an, about to get promoted to E4 and everything. And I just had a, a moment that night. But, you know, the next day I woke up and said, all right, that's over with. Let's go. I got to do things. I got to get my family over here. I got to get situated. I went from there, you know. But then, you know, you talk about getting out. Here I was living overseas and, you know, I was a huge football fan. You know the deal, the football games come on at like midnight or three in the morning on Monday morning, and I had to go to work and everything. (laughs) There's a point as a young person that joins the military, you're constantly looking back at the life you left. And for me, it was Davenport, Iowa with all my friends and everything and family. And, you know, to a certain point, you think at that young, naive age and being a soldier that you're putting your life on hold for a little bit. And you keep looking back. And so even in Germany, I was looking back and I wasn't looking forward. And until it came time to reenlist and, you know, and I talk about in the book how Sandra was, you know, really upset with me because I was talking about like I wanted to get out because I wanted to be able to watch football on a Sunday at a normal time. And finally, when I made the decision to reenlist, I said, hey, I want to we're going to go where I want to go. And that's Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And And so that's where we, and so when I got to the 82nd and I saw the kind of esprit de corps camaraderie and everything that goes with being a paratrooper. And the minute I put that red beret on, I said, it's time to look forward and no longer looking back. I couldn't worry about what was going on in Davenport, what my friends were doing. Now this is my career and let's focus forward. And from there on, that's what I did. And that's how I think it transformed me into this career soldier that was striving for excellence, but more importantly, trying to be the example 
for others to strive for excellence. Did Sander really not talk to you for two days when you said you were going to get out? Oh, yeah. Two days? Oh, yeah. Yeah, two days. She was just cold. She knew, you know, and I talk about it in the book, you know, she's first generation Mexican-American. She had 18 brothers and sisters. She grew up a very <laughs> impoverished life, you know, and she knew what it was like not to have anything. And she knew that when I said, well, we'll go back to Iowa, you know, and and I'll get a job doing something. We'll live with mom and pop. She knew that I didn't know how to do anything else. And I was a pretty good soldier and that I wasn't thinking. And so I realized then, you know, when for that two days that she was just being, I said, I can't live like this. And I love this woman too much to, to say, well, then we'll go our separate ways. So I said, all right, it, that's what it took to get, to get me to realize and see myself. And when we got to Fort Bragg, and, you know, and after I had fallen out of the run and now I was really, you know, getting, you know, to where I needed to be to to excel as a paratrooper and everything. I realized then that I did not miss my calling, you know, and I almost did. Were it not for Sandra kicking me in the butt, I would have missed that calling. And Lord knows what I would have been doing outside the military and uh, everything. So that's what kind of got us on the path uh, to continue to move up. All right, let's talk about going to the 82nd. We've talked about it already. The first run, you fall out. I think after a mile and a quarter, you fell out. So they must have been really moving. My first question <laughs> my first question from the 82nd is, I want to know how much Ron Reagan, Command Sergeant Major, had to do with your military persona that you ended up with. Oh, huge. Huge. He was the first command sergeant major i take it back there was there was a you know a couple of command sergeant majors in germany that saw potential in me but they were kind of you know do as i'm telling you kind and not showcase showing me what to do reagan was the first command sergeant major in my career that led through his actions okay and everything he did was geared towards combat readiness being a proud paratrooper, being fit and, and, and doing things right. And I remember, you know, early on, I was in the chow hall there and he came in and he went to sit down at a table and there were no napkins in the napkin holder. And then he looked at uh, some of the other tables and they were, there was no napkins. So the, the mess staff had not been taking care of business and he slung that napkin holder across the chow hall and it smacked against the wall but it caught everybody's attention and he said this is just like in combat when you don't have enough ammunition all right he said i can draw a straight line from this to actions in combat that will get us killed and i thought wow you know i had never heard that kind of language before even though i was i had served in germany on the east german border and everything no one talked about going to war like guys like Ron Reagan did in the leaders I had in the 82nd because of the wheels up 18 hours or less anywhere in the world in combat. And that came to fruition just a couple of years after I got there when 18 hours after alert, I was fighting uh, in, in Panama City. And because of Ron Reagan and his focus, you know, and then we came back from the field on a Friday, you know, and we kind of half-assed, you know, our closeout stuff and everything. And Reagan walked into the motor pool and saw that, you know, there were leaves and gun tubes and mud on, on you know, road wheels and everything. So the next day he called all of us in, all of us NCOs, not the Joes, just us NCOs. And he made us clean the entire wash rack, wash all of our, I mean, the whole battalion's NCOs. No officers were present and no E4 and below. It was just us NCOs. And again, another lesson from this guy, you're a leader. You're supposed to be leading through your example. I trust that you're going to do the right thing and unsupervised, you know, and then when I come down to inspect, you guys screw me over. And I thought, wow, what another example. And he was just so powerful in building not only me, but so many of the other non-commissioned officers in that battalion, which it's no wonder that two SEACs came out of that battalion from him as well as numerous nominative level command sergeant majors and, and sergeant majors that served at the battalion and brigade level. He was just a phenomenal leader that led through his actions. Seeing how he responded to 
the napkin incident. We'll just use that one. That's not possible today. That kind oh, of no. thing is not possible. So let me ask yeah. you, you've been to the highest level. Is that going to hurt us in the end? So here's, here's what I would say to that. Generations change, you know, and if I, when I look at this generation now, and it's not even the video game generation so much or the computer generation, it's all about this phone is what they're about now. And their communication isn't by a phone call. It's by a FaceTime, you know, or something like that. It's that constant communication with this. They're not outside a lot, you know, you know, and I'll give you an example. You know, I was getting ready here in the spring to have my first cookout at the house and I was cleaning up my backyard and I pulled a tarp off my grill. My teenage granddaughter was there with me and she was helping me. And when we pulled that tarp off, there was a bunch of slugs on the ground. Okay. You know, the little slimy slugs. So what does uh, Troxel do? You know, go and get a hammer. And I start smashing these slugs. And she says to me, but Papa, what did the slugs do wrong? And I said, well, baby girl, they were at the wrong place at the wrong time and at the wrong end of the food chain. And that's just the way it is. Okay. But my point is, is that in her mind, you know, the slugs deserve to have a, you know, legal representation and everything on, on squatters rights or something like that, you know? So the point is generations continue to change in the kind of things, uh, methods that were used to instill discipline in Troxel back in the eighties, how do we bridge generations and bring the desired effect that it got on Troxel to me, but using far less draconian methods? And I think that's why, now remember back then, you know, in the 80s, we were still a just 10 years as a professional non-commissioned officer corps. Shoot, we only had 12 years as an all-volunteer force. So we were still in fledgling years as we were moving in. Now, if you look where we're at now, our greatest competitive advantage over any threat is our non-commissioned officer and petty officer corps. Because of the level of knowledge, the level of experience and the level of trust we put in them that allows them to be empowered and get after things. We want the same desired effect that we got to get Troxel to do the right thing back in the 80s, but we've got to bridge it to methods that are, you know, consistent with this generation and everything. And I will tell you, one of the things I talk about all the time is the need to balance the art of leadership and influence and balance means there has to be a certain level of discipline and accountability obviously because we we're all about combat along with empathy and compassion for the troops that when you bring them together and they're balanced it equals efficiency in our warrior tasks and drills but more importantly our mission essential tasks and we'll build efficiencies on the worst day of our life in combat so <clears throat> That's what I would say on how we have to get after it now. Now, you know, the best way to bridge that is to continue on every day having a transformational approach as a leader that builds synergistic relationships and cohesion within their team, squad, platoon, company, battalion, whatever it is, that they're constantly doing that every day, building that. And I call it delivering the why. You know, every day, well, every time we get a mission, we get task and purpose. So we, here's what I need you to do, and here's why I need you to do it. So if every day we are delivering the why and our troops are fully knowledgeable of what they have to do, when it comes time where we don't have the time and place to explain the why, and we just say, you just haul ass to or execute, they'll get it because we built this level of trust and respect and synergy over the constant sets and reps. What I see nowadays, because I spend a lot of time with the troops still, is I see mid-range leaders, NCOs, and petty officers that don't want to explain the why. They just want to say, just do it, you know, and throw a knife edge out, you know, and everything. And I think we got to get better in that because of the internet, because of globalization, because the troops have knowledge at their fingertip that you can't just say, you just haul ass too, as a means of everyday leadership. There has to be a level of trust that's built that, that is built 
by delivering the why and Bill having a transformational, not a transactional approach to the way you lead. Let me play devil's advocate for a minute with you. When <laughs> Please you, do. When you say all of those things, I, I get it. And and now, you know, I, I haven't been in the military in <laughs> two decades. I've been law enforcement for almost the past two decades now. Yeah. And I look at when you say to give the why and to explain that, and you say synergistic and you use these words, and I, I fear sometimes that we get so much into ourselves of explaining the buzzwords, of explaining why we need to do something that I think it loses its effect sometime because I still like a leader that knows what they want and just gets it done. You, you can get it done or you can move on to the next task, meaning you can move on somewhere else. I love leaders like that. I'm not saying they should be used everywhere. I think that's a leadership characteristic that is very much undermanned and is escaping our society quickly. Well, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a fair argument. But let me ask you this, DJ. Would you want one of your soldiers to die in combat not knowing why they were doing the mission they were doing, what the desired end state for the mission is and what success looks like? Would you want someone to die with all that uncertainty going on? I certainly wouldn't. And so my point is this, and I, I saw this when I was the CIA. The more the troops know where they're going, why they're going there, how long they're going to have to do it, and then what kind of conditions are leaving, even if it's the most harshest, most dangerous conditions on the planet, as long as they know all that stuff, they're going to get after the mission and they're going to accomplish it. And, and they might be pissing and moaning because of that, you know, but in the end, they're going to get the job done. And I go back to the Afghanistan, the abrupt dis disorderly withdrawal of Afghanistan, where the strategy made sure that all the risk was incurred at the tactical level. I mean, I thought it was a, a huge mistake, but at the tactical level, the troops knew we've got two weeks to evacuate all these people. We don't have the initiative now. The enemy owns the terrain right outside Kabul airport and everything, but we got to get the job done. And the troops knew the why. They knew what they were expected to do. They knew they had to get out by 31 August, and they knew everything they needed to do to get after that. And it sucked. It absolutely sucked. And in the end, because the strategy and the timeline, in, in Troxel's opinion, didn't give them the enough time to get things done or put us in a position where the enemy had an advantage, you know, uh, 13 Americans lost their lives to a suicide bomb. I blame that on the strategy to get after that. I don't blame that on the actions at the tactical level. But the bottom line is 124,000 people got evacuated out of there. We destroyed all the equipment or the vast majority of it on Kabul airport. Although the Afghans, or excuse me, the Taliban had $86 billion worth of uh, Afghan security force equipment and everything. But the bottom line, the troops got the job done. All right. And so my point in all of this is on any given day, even in the 80s, when you got an operations order, you got the who, what, where, when, why in that mission statement. You got the why. And then in the concept of the operation, the execution paragraph, you got the how. So if our orders process is so disciplined that we give everything, why can't a leader through their every day, what they do, say, here's, here's what we're going to do and here's why we're going to do it. And, then, and if people piss them on, you can tell them, hey, shut the fuck up. We're still going to do it. You know, I mean, in a, in a tactful kind of way, you know, but the point is I went through my career. I wanted the troops to know the importance and the purpose for everything we were doing. So because in the end, I just didn't want discipline, which was, you know, a willing obedience to orders. I wanted self-discipline where they were bought in to what we were doing, the process of us getting after it. And they knew that they were part of this solution to accomplish the mission or get us to where we needed to be. And that really hit me when I was a platoon sergeant in Germany in 92 to 95, when I write about in the book about the platoon I had over there, it was arguably the, the best array of talent I had in my military career. And it got to the point that 
you know, we were just so cohesive that on the weekends, we were spending our all our time together, you know, not just during the work. We wanted to be around. We wanted to hang around each other. We wanted to be our families to be around each other. And that's the kind of standard I think we ought to seek in today's military, you know. Um, but too many times we got people that want to push back against it. So I understand what you're saying. That's a fair argument and everything. And sometimes you have to be that way. I'm not saying, you know, certainly if you're in the middle of getting ambushed, all right, you, you, you had better have rehearsed your battle drills on how to react to an ambush, you know, and, and, and built a level of proficiency in it that the minute you started getting ambushed, you knew that somebody was going to lay down a base of fire and other element is going to move out of contact to attack the flank of that ambushing element to take them out, you know, and because certainly at that time, you don't have time to say, hey, Johnny Joe, I need you to go over there. Be careful, you know, because there might be a, you don't have time to you just say, hey, execute battle drill, uh, whatever, you know, one alpha or whatever, and let's get after it. You know, I've heard some other guys, uh, a command master chief, he always looked at it as people will eat a shit sandwich as long as you tell them why they're eating a shit sandwich. Yeah. And he said, and it's a crazy how many times that someone would eat a shit sandwich just by getting a simple explanation. But I like to play the devil's advocate part of that because I, I see that slipping away quickly. Well, I will tell you this. I, I will give you this, brother. Whatever is causing this, I do see an, a slight erosion of standards, okay, uh, across the force. Now, I am completely confident in our ability, and I still firmly believe we have competitive warfighting advantages in all domains, ground, air, sea, space, nuclear, cyber, all that stuff, but I see there are some that think because we're post-Afghanistan and the GWAT is over and everything, they think we're moving into some kind of uh, era of persistent peace. And I think that is a the most dangerous assumption we could have right now with what communist China is doing. And don't get me started on the balloon. You know, Russia's in the middle of a war where they're getting their nose bloodied. And what does Vladimir Putin do next? Kim Jong-un in North Korea, he is still you know, a regional player and wants to be a global player, you know, with his nuclear arsenal and everything. And then the Iranians still the number one state sponsor of terrorism and through their proxy forces, still doing a lot of malign shit in the Middle East. And then, you know, we can't forget about ISIS and Al Qaeda. You know, they might be nascent threats right now, but there's no doubt that their goal is still to plan, prepare, export and execute spectacular terrorist attacks on the West whether that's in Western Europe, North America, and certainly the prime target is the United States of America. So we live in this contentious world and probably the most contentious operational environment our troops will been in and, and confusing environment. And if we don't approach it right and we, if we don't continue to focus our armed forces to be ready to fight and win on any given day and, and not get caught up in all of this, uh, social innuendo and experiments and all this other stuff, I fear we could uh, erode those competitive advantages and pretty soon it could be an ugly day for us. So I think there is a limit to some of this stuff, you know, that that we need to be getting after. Don't get me wrong. You know, we want everybody to be treated with dignity and respect. We want to, you know, enlist every able-bodied American that would want to be in. But I think you're seeing some of these things these social kind of things are bearing out now where the last two years, the army hasn't met its recruiting mission. And now the air force and Navy are, are struggling with theirs and probably won't make it this year. So the point is there's a reason for why military service isn't attractive as it once was when you and I first came in or certainly right after nine 11. And I think what you're kind of describing has some, some, I, I can't believe that it it doesn't have anything to do with it, like there are some pundits in Washington saying. I think it absolutely are contributing factors why we can't get the requisite numbers we need. Oh, yeah. We can't meet yeah. numbers either. And there yeah. there is a, I will agree with you, there's a, I don't know if it's a steady decline, but there's definitely a change of standards out there. And the change of standards, oh, yeah. I think, puts you into an OODA loop with everything that's going on because... You lower your standards, then you get lower people, then you get more problems, 
then you got to get rid of those people. Then you have problems. Then you can't get new people. Then you change the standards again. And you get into this situation where it's, it's intangible that you can even fix it. So I, I, I absolutely agree with you. And I just had this conversation. I was at Fort Liberty last week and, in, in a town hall during this CEO thank you tour that I've been on. And a first sergeant asked me about this same question. And I said, you know, unchecked behavior that continues to go unchecked can become unsafe. Well, it can become undisciplined, then it can become unsafe, then it can become dangerous and ultimately it can become deadly in terms of what can happen to our force. And I, and I am of the opinion that if we don't discipline how we look, then, you know, that's going to lead to indiscipline on how we talk, which will further lead to indiscipline on how we act, and ultimately will lead to indiscipline and inefficiency on how we perform, especially in combat. I think being a soldier or being a member of the United States military, there has to be this requisite discipline on how you look, how you act, and how you talk that will lead to how you perform at the, at the worst moment when we need it, in combat. And so it all starts on the far left. If we're continuing to police stuff up like that, then I think we will be better off in the end. Well, and I think with the military, it's it's the broken windows theory of law enforcement. If you take care of the small things, yeah. the big things will take care of themselves. And you, you talk about the end result kind of being how we perform in combat. Let's talk about a little of your combat career. 19 December, 1989. When you think about it in your head, does it all come rushing back? I mean, can you feel what you felt that day still? Uh, that's the first time you're being called up. And like you said, 18 hours, wheels up anywhere. Let's talk about how you felt going into it. And I even want to talk about the jump and looking out the door and seeing fighting going on below you as you're going out the door. So walk us through that very first time you go into combat. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, DJ. So the hair is starting to raise up on my arms already. So, you know, I got to the 82nd Airborne Division, and like we talked earlier about, now I'm very purposeful. I, I'm very motivated. The esprit de corps and the camaraderie is just something. And we constantly were preparing to go to combat, constantly. You know, I would end up on Division Ready Force uh, plenty of times. But we were a peacetime military. And so... You know, there was no indicators that, you know, we were going to go to war, even though, you know, through the fall of 89 down in Panama, Noriega had lost the election, uh, the, the president who was the dictator, and he refused to leave office. And then his dignity battalions and his uh, Panamanian defense forces started doing things to abuse Americans down there. And at one point, a lieutenant was killed. You know, while another officer and his family were brutally beaten and everything. So in November, one of our platoons covertly uh, was sent down to Panama. And we thought, OK, it's a deterrent force. You know, we're going to get Sheridan tanks down there. So as a as a deterrent, you know, and everything, we still didn't think we were going to go to combat. And then they left in mid-November and they were continuing to train and do things down there. And so, you know, the 19th of December was the start of half day schedule. And so, uh, you know, I kissed, kissed Sandra goodbye that morning and said, Hey, when I get home at noon, you know, we'll go Christmas shopping for the boys. Now I was on division ready force one, but I, I still thought, you know, Hey, you know, we're not going to war or anything. Well, that changed in a heartbeat when I got in and we got alerted. Now, initially we thought that, you know, because we always did it on division ready force one, we would get alerted, marshaled, we would move out, fly to an airfield in South Carolina or Florida, do a jump and just practice going through the motions, which is probably a smart thing, you know, getting ready for the real thing. So we still weren't convinced that we were going to war. We thought we were doing another exercise. And so here we are in the personnel holding area and I'm antsy. I want to know what the hell is going on. And so does my platoon sergeant, Dave Freeman. I was a staff sergeant at the time. So Freeman and I decided, let's go walk over to the Brigade Tactical Operations Center and uh, and let's see what the hell is going on. And so we walked over there. You know, we, we climbed over the concertina wire 
you know, because we knew the guy at the gate wasn't going to let us or at the entrance of the wire wasn't going to let us in. So we walked over the concertina wire. And as we walked up to the front of the tent, the guy says, hey, can I see your pass? And we just walked by and went inside, you know. And as we went inside, there were staff officers that were laminating maps of Panama. And so Freeman and I looked at each other and we said, well, you know, we, we know where we're going now. And then, and we overheard the S3 Air, the operations air officer talking about this jump is going to be 20 C-141s, uh, drop altitude 500 feet and everything. And I said, yep, we're going to make a combat jump. So now it kind of turned. And on the walk back, Freeman and I were both kind of like, hey, this is it. This is, we got to go back and get the boys ready here. You know, we went back and explained that, hey, I know where we're going. You know, we're, we're heading to Panama, all right? And as we were sitting there, you know, talking and everything, the chaplain from the brigade happened to walk in and said, hey, uh, boys, have you heard yet? And we said, yeah, yes, sir. We kind of know what we're doing. They said, anybody want to do a prayer? Every person to a man, you know, went over there and did a prayer with the chaplain. There were no atheists. You know, the old phrase, DJ, there's no <laughs> atheists and foxholes. There was no atheists in that tent at the personnel holding area on Pope Air Force Base. We all went and said the prayer. And it was a freezing rainstorm. To, to make things worse, it's a freezing rainstorm. And, you know, the heaters aren't working well in the tents. So we're freezing our asses off. And we're getting ready, you know, to, to do the jump and everything. We go through pre-jump. We get issued all of our live ammunition and everything. And before long, it's time to board the aircrafts and, and go. And so um, we get on the planes. And, and you know the deal. The door shut. And we're still freezing our ass off, even though we're in a combat concentrated load with max number of jumpers. And as we are flying, you know, we're all just kind of, you know, in our own little worlds, like continuing to talk about what we needed to do, hit the ground. And for us, it was move out to the nearest Sheridan, start derigging it. The minute you had a crew of four, that you get that thing together and you get up onto the uh, assault objective and link up with the infantry units and everything. And so, you know, the doors open and that's when that blast furnace of Panamanian heat came in. And I knew then, yep, <laughs> this, this is the real thing here. And then as I exited the aircraft over Torrijos International Airport, I could tell on Takiman Airfield, the military airfield to the north, which was kind of adjacent, that the Rangers were already in combat and were already fighting their asses off. And I said, okay, this is it, you know, and, and I hit the ground and, and, and got on a, a Sheridan and got up as fast as I could to provide support. And, and we were moving out with the Rangers and our infantry guys out into objectives for the next week. And, you know, we had several firefights there. And I kind of talked about it in the book, you know, that when you're the only tank in town, which we weren't really a tank, armored reconnaissance airborne assault vehicle, you're the best tank in town. <laughs> and every time we get fired at with, you know, 50 cal and everything that the those infantry guys would be hugging road wheels because they had nothing else to protect themselves with. But the point being uh, was, you know, this is what, you know, when I joined the 82nd Airborne Division, uh, this is what the talk was all about. And here, just over two years after I arrived in that unit, two and a half years, here I was parachuting into combat and fighting against enemy forces in Panama. So it came to fruition, you know, and and after it was all said and done, seven months later, I was moving back into a combat zone in Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm with the 82nd Airborne Division again. So, and, and that's kind of what told me just cause was that if you train like you're going to fight, then it'll, your fighting will be instinctive. And, and I, after that, my focus for the rest of my career was to continue to train for the worst day of our life, be best prepared, set high standards and get after it, because that's what's going to continue to allow us to have the advantage over the enemy. But more importantly, it's going to be what gets us victory. Do you remember what you thought stepping out the door? I know you knew that it was real, but do you remember the thoughts that went through your head? <laughs> well, I said to myself, the minute the green light came on, I said, well, there's no turning back now, you know, and I had thought one of the thoughts I had <laughs> as I was standing there, you know, and, uh, you know, and we were like a minute out from the drop zone. I did have a moment thinking about Sandra because she, there was no cell phones. The phone lines were cut. She had no idea. I think she kind of had an idea that I was going to be in combat, 
uh, or I, I wasn't, she knew I wasn't coming home for one, but, uh, I just thought about her and I said, well, sooner or later, she's going to figure out that I'm in combat and, uh, and I've done everything necessary in terms of my life insurance, my SGLI and all that other stuff that if I don't come home, I know she's going to be taken care of. So fuck it, let's go. That's kind of, you know, <laughs> what my attitude was, you know, and, and, uh, as I exited the aircraft, the minute I, I left the aircraft and my parachute opened, my mindset was totally on the mission. Now it wasn't on, you know, my wife and kids, you know, I put them in the back of my brain so I wouldn't think about them. And I focused totally on what was happening and what we needed to do to be victorious, uh, on, in, on the battlefield there. So yeah, that's kind of what my mindset was. Now I'm going to say this guy's name. I'm, I'm probably going to mess up the name so you can correct me. Uh, specialist Alejandro Manrique Lozano. Is that correct? Okay. Alejandro Enrique Lozano. He he's killed very shortly into battle. Very of course, shortly. of course, you say it's real while you're in the aircraft. You know that it's when you see this though. Does it make it a different kind of real? And I don't know if that makes any sense, but does it does it make you think you're playing maybe for different stakes? Yeah, I think so. I think uh, okay, exiting out and then seeing what was going on on the north end of the airfield was one thing. But the minute we started moving out on our objectives and expanding the lodgement beyond the airport and the military airfield where the enemy forces were consolidated at and all of a sudden starting to take fire and everything and returning fire. But even then, you know, until, you know, we get word, hey, Alejandro, our kid was killed, you know, and I mean, DJ, we're two hours into the operation and this young man was killed in action by direct fire by Panamanian defense forces. And so, and I, I never saw him. Okay. At that point, but as we made our way to our assault objective on Tinahitas Hill, and we got to the top of the hill after fighting our way all the way to the top of it. And then I saw on the helipad there two uh, Americans being zipped up into body bags and uh, that was Jerry Scott Daves and uh, Denson was the other kid's name. And that's when it hit me when I saw Daves, who had the same 82nd Airborne Division patch on, the same glint tape, the same American flag, because we didn't wear the American flag on our uniform back then on a regular basis. We only put it on for contingency operations. And when I saw that guy getting zipped up in the bag, that had a profound impact on me because... Uh, you know, that was the first one that I had seen killed in action. Does it harden you in your stance about how you feel? Because at this point now in your career, you know what you're here to do. The The days of getting out of the military, taking another job, this is it. it th those days are way gone. Does it harden you in your stance seeing that? Absolutely, it did. Well, again, it, it showed me that the price of freedom is not free. You know, the enemy gets a vote. Don't get me wrong. And sometimes the enemy gets us, you know, and the worst day of my life was 19 July 2007, you know, when I was ambushed and Corporal Brandon Craig was killed and Danny Dudek was severely wounded and several of my other troops were were wounded as well. But that from that point on, I said, I'm going to do what is ever necessary as a leader to make sure that the soldiers under my charge were best prepared. And I wasn't, you know, looking for likership. I was looking for people that were prepared to go and fight and win, you know. And so I, that's the way I, I led from there, which is why the subchapter in Chapter 2 about my time in Germany, 92 to 95, you know, I had such a great cast of characters around me that uh, we were able to get after that and do that. You know, I, and I have that question right here, Germany, 92 to 95. How did you change the way you and your unit trained after two deployments with the 82nd? A and you answered that. <laughs> it, it, yeah. it was nothing but real life from then on. Yeah. And so it, what helped is my first sergeant over there was a guy named John Winters, who I had served with in the 82nd. So he kind of knew the standards of the 82nd. And so my platoon was the only platoon in that squadron that wore camouflage paint on, on our faces in the field and wore body armor. Okay. I mean, we were a peacetime military again, you know, desert storms over with and everything. 
and everybody wanted to go back to the other way. And, and I wasn't having it. I said, Hey, when we go to combat, we're going to be wearing body armor. We're going to be wearing camouflage. So we're going to wear it in training. So I had great platoon leaders, uh, but more importantly, I had great NCOs. And one of the guys in particular I talk about so profoundly in there is a guy named Steve Zebarth. As a matter of fact, I just saw Steve last week when I was at Fort Liberty. Uh, he's retired and he still supports the military uh, in a job on Fort Liberty. But Zebarth was a young E5. He was a master gunner and he was a master at technical and tactical aspects of being an armored reconnaissance specialist. And he was my go-to guy, even though I had four staff sergeants around me, Zebarth was my best NCO. But more importantly, the young troops I had there, guys like Vince Cunningham, Matt Foley, and Jim Bossom, and all these other guys that were just so fired up and ready to get after it. Um, and then, you know, my squad leaders, my, my, they were good as well, too. And we just became this cohesive platoon that said, we're going to be the best at what we do. And we were the top platoon on our platoon maneuver in the squadron. We were tops and everything we tried to do. We were so cohesive, but that's the kind of leadership that I was going to have and I was going to exhibit for the rest of my career because I had seen, you know, what had ha what happens in combat. And I was going to make sure that the troops under me were the best prepared, fully understanding that the enemy gets a vote. And sometimes you can have be the best trained, best prepared, and the enemy can still snatch a knot in your ass and it can cause people to come home. And I lost four guys as a squadron sergeant major in 03, 04 in Iraq. Worse yet, during the surge in Iraq, I lost 54 good men and had over 500 wounded. And then Afghanistan 11 and 12 as the core level sergeant major, we had 233 Americans in that year that were killed in action. So certainly the enemy gets a vote, but you know, you know the deal. The more you're prepared, the more you're trained, the more you're ready, uh, the chances are that... Uh, you will have the advantages over the enemy in 99.9% in .9 of the situation, fully understanding that the enemy has their own initiatives and own ways of gaining advantages. I want to point out something really quick going back before Germany, Operation Desert Shield and Storm. You say about 100 hours till there was a ceasefire. You said nowhere near the amount of combat of Panama. When you see yeah. that, not only... Do you go back to war three weeks before you deploy? You have another son and that's your youngest son that's born. So now you have your three sons. You go over there. It's not what it was in Panama. It's still combat. It's still leading your nation. Are you let down at all by how it worked out over there? No, I, actually, it was the opposite, DJ. I, you know, we had sat in the desert and there were 430,000 Iraqi troops in southern, in Kuwait and southern Iraq, 430,000 troops. And for the first 60 days, it was the 82nd Airborne Division. That was, you know, we were a speed bump up there. And here I was in my <laughs> platoon battle position and the company commander is briefing me and saying, all right, we've got the Iraqi Hammurabi Division over here in the the Leskarova division over here and everything. And I'm like, divisions? You mean like 20,000 troops? I said, we're a platoon of 30 people and we got 40,000 troops in front of us here. <laughs> so we were truly a speed bump. When when the air war started- Can I you interrupt know, you for just a yeah, second? Uh, I just want to ask, it was a brigade, right? That was the whole combat plan was your brigade was going to hold back these two divisions, right? Yeah, you know, about 4,000 troops- we're going to hold that, hold back 40,000. Okay. The intent was this, that, and we've done, we've done the same thing, you know, in most recent times with forces. If we put 4,000 American troops up there alongside the Saudi forces, um, we looked at that more as a deterrent to, you know, any more Iraqi or Saddam Hussein aggression. We thought American troops on the front line, Saddam Hussein, he knows it's going to be a different, and he knows that here in a bit, you know, as soon as the ships get over uh, with all of the heavy armor and everything, that it's going to be a different uh, war. Uh, now, if he would have been smart, he would have attacked right then, okay, because he would have, we would have been rolled over in 
ended up being smoke and grease stains right there because we were so outnumbered. But because he waited and allowed us to build combat power, not only with U.S., but coalition forces all the way from the coast of the eastern part of Saudi Arabia on the border of Kuwait, all the way out west, then all of a sudden we kind of, uh, you know, we built our own advantages there. And that's the mistake that Saddam Hussein made. But the bottom line in all of this, and I talk about this in the book, this was the, really the first time that I had talked about crossing over. So when we knew that this was the size of the force and the capability we were going to face, we all thought we weren't coming home. We all thought this is it. We're going to die. All right. So if we are going to die, then we're going to take as many of these bastards as we can with us. So, and I talk about this, you know, physically, everybody wants to live. Nobody wants to die. But mentally and emotionally, you cross over that it is inevitable that you're going to die in combat. And it's going to be a horrible death here because you're facing T-72 tanks, BMPs, MLTBs, all of these armored vehicles. And you're, we're so outnumbered. And we had one battalion of tanks along with this brigade plus full of infantrymen. So we, we're just like, we have crossed over. So there's more of a stoic, disciplined approach now. Because we know that, hey, this is it, you know. And then the minute we saw that when we started the offensive, and I knew it was over, the minute we were getting spot reports that there was this robust Iraqi formation at this checkpoint and that we were going to have to fight. And when I got to that checkpoint, there were 20th Engineer Battalion vehicles all over the place. Not a sign of the Iraqis. And my message to my platoon leader was, well, either the 20th Engineer Battalion has defected to the Iraqis or that threat does not exist, okay? <laughs> and I knew then that because we had put, the, the air war had done so much damage that uh, it was highly unlikely that we were going to see heavy combat after that. So I talk about this, you know, crossing over, and that takes a mental and emotional toll out of you. But now you realize you're going home and now you got to cross back over knowing that you're going to live and that you got to go back home and, you know, be a father again, a husband and all these other things. And that's where we run into challenges, especially with PTSD and the global war on terrorism showed us that, you know, when you can have challenges with this and everything. But the point being with that is I was grateful and I was relieved that we weren't going to see this hard fighting because I knew none of my men were going to get killed. And uh, chances are that all of us now were going to go home, even though for six months sitting in that desert, we, we were under the assumption and we had crossed over that we were all going to die. But we were going to go out on our, our swords and our shields uh, fighting our ass off, you know. And so when it became a rout, and that's what it was, we routed the Iraqi forces. I was like, OK, I'm relieved that this isn't like. Panama. Don't get me wrong, we lost a significant amount of troops over there, over 100. But in terms of the ratio, you know, 100 when we had, what, two whole corps there at the time and everything. I mean, we had hundreds of thousands of troops there. When in Panama, here we were just a brigade of 4,000 and we lost 18 troops. You know, our, excuse me, we lost four in the 82nd, 18 in the overall operation. In every street corner, we were getting into a firefight. So that's the difference in that. And again, in the Desert Storm, that was some standoff warfare where, you know, aircraft, M1 tanks, uh, artillery pieces, Bradley fighting vehicles, uh, and Sheridan tanks uh, were what the, you know, it wasn't the up close and personal fighting either. I want to talk about a couple of the other things that you do. We talked about Germany a little bit, but you go back to the 82nd Airborne again. Uh, and I want to talk about this one, not because there's any combat involved, but this is where you kind of start working on the welfare of the troops. And, and that's physically, mentally, emotionally, like we talked about. Uh, you make the shadow lounge in the supply room. Completely yeah. would not happen these days. There's not a chance in hell that would happen. But I want you to kind of explain what you did and why you did it, because I thought it was a hilarious part of the book. So I came back, you know, when I came back to the division, I had some personal goals. I wanted to I wanted to go to ranger school, you know, and uh, and I did that. And then I became the first sergeant of the ground recce troop, a unique organization 
uh, in an air cavalry squadron. And we did a lot of jumping. And sometimes those jumps would be on Friday night. And I, I wanted to be more transformational in my approach as opposed to transactional, you know. I, I wanted us to come back from that jump and be like a family, you know. And I, and I call it, to this day, I still call it the cool of the evening. You know, the work is over. We've done this jump. Everybody's okay. We're on the cattle cars. We're coming home. And, you know, we, and it's that just that feeling of satisfaction. But I wanted to make it even better. So um, I got all my platoon sergeants together and I said, hey, guys, uh, I want to turn the supply room. And I had my supply sergeant in there, too. I said, I want to, you know, get some money from you guys. We'll buy some hot dogs, chips, sodas, stuff like that. And we'll sell them to the troops uh, out of the supply room. And with the money we make from that, we will buy more snacks, but we'll buy beer. And then all, after a jump, we'll all come into the supply room and everybody will have a free beer. So, so if you wanted a bag of chips or a soda, you had to pay for it. But if you wanted a beer, you got it for free. And so I wanted us to be able to come back and experience the cool of the evening you know, because we were jumping at night all the time then. And, you know, here we are, grimy, sweaty, still camouflage on our faces and everything, sitting in the supply room, sitting around the, the unit area and just experienced a moment where we could have a cold beer and the, the troops and the NCOs and officers were all just having this, uh, this moment of just engaging each other uh, on the common ground as paratroopers. And, and so that's kind of why I did it. And that turned into the shadow lounge. And so, you know, every time there was a jump, even if I wasn't on it, their commander wasn't on it, even if it was only 20 jumpers that were on it, whoever the senior guy was when they got back had the key to the supply room and go in and open the shadow lounge and let the guys have a beer before they went home, you know. <clears throat> and again, we had some things in place to make sure people didn't get stupid, you know, and, <laughs> and try to drive home, you know. But the point was, again, Going back to being an authentic leader, I think anybody and everybody that does things like that, jumping out of an airplane, uh, you know, and hitting the ground and, and getting up and running to the assembly area and everything in the middle of summer and it's hot and everything, the first thing on their mind when they get back, man, I could go for a cold beer. And so that's what I wanted them to be able to do. And that's why we did it. And I will tell you, it had a huge impact, you know, to the point that we had so much money in that supply room that all of a sudden when there was a family that had a financial crisis on their hands, we could take money out of that supply room and give it to that family so they could get groceries or repairs on their vehicle or whatever. Again, some people will frown on that, you know, and certainly today, if you did that today, you probably find yourself, you know, in jail, but certainly at the very least on the cover of Army Times or something, you know. But back then, that was how we, we took care of troops and, uh, and I wanted to make sure that we had something in place that we could take care of those families. So we need to talk about something important from this trip to Bragg. Uh, this is your first investigation, and I love how you said it in the book. It was my first investigation. It definitely was not my last. But I, I think that you've gone so far in your career. We're in 98 now, so January 98, doing a night jump. You get a static line ripped. What was interesting about this whole thing to me and, and being able to finish the book, because at first it didn't really resonate with me, but after reading what happened as a SEAC and all those kind of things, your quote here said, by far the toughest event in my military career. And, and I started thinking, wow, he was sidelined for six months as the highest enlisted guy. And I tried to piece it together. And it just, I couldn't make it make sense. I couldn't make the math math on that one. And yeah. I thought, I've got to ask him about this because for this to be the toughest event, I get, by no means am I making it small or anything what happened, but it was strange to hear you say that that was the toughest event. Yeah, and for a couple of reasons. So this was Operation Purple Dragon. It was the largest peacetime event uh, airdrop ever. And it was as large as the Normandy drop, uh, in World War II. So we had paratroopers dropping on Sicily drop zone. I was going into Holland drop zone, but we also had jumps in South Carolina, North Airfield, South Carolina, Avon Park, Gunnery Range, Florida. I mean, the entire division 
was going out on the jump. And so now I'm a primary jump master on one of the aircraft and uh, going through the pre-jump and everything, there were so many jumpers that showed up that had deficiencies in their equipment and uh, their equipment wasn't rigged properly and everything. So I was, you know, short on patience. I was being a straight prick, you know, because uh, I, I was a stickler for safety. And this one kid, the kid that died on the jump, you know, he had so many deficiencies rigged into his equipment, you know, that I sent him over to a correction station and had him get fixed and they brought him back, you know, and, and he's a young PFC, you know, and he was an engineer. And so we get on the aircraft and, you know, I mean, you're talking all these aircraft in the air. And when you, you're talking this jump on Holland, there's 700 jumpers in the air. I mean, it is a very high end, high performance potentially dangerous uh, way of doing business. We started exiting the, the troops out of the aircraft and I wanted to get everybody out on the first path because when you have 20 C-141s in a formation coming over the drop zone, if you have to do a second pass, turning 20 airplanes around, that's like an hour to come back around to be able to do another pass. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to get everybody out on the first pass so we could hit the simulated assault objectives uh, training objectives and get after it. And so my door, I got everybody out on the, and I turned around to my assistant jump master and he had five jumpers left that didn't get out when the red light came on. So I was in the middle of chewing his ass for not getting his jumpers out. And my safety NCO looks at me and he hands me this. He says, look at this static line. And the static line looked like a static line you would find in the mock door trainer back in the garrison area because it was ripped. I look at that and I automatically thought there is somebody out there that has no lift capability now. And so the load master comes to me and says, all right, we're going around to do a second pass. It's going to take an hour. I said, no, we're not. I said, look at this static line. There is a jumper out there that has no lift capability right now. And I hope and pray to God he pulls his reserve parachute because if he doesn't, he's going to plummet to his death. I said, we need to break formation and we need to go back to Pope Air Force Base right now and land because there will be an investigation. And I told everybody, I said, you know, the, the remaining, my jump master crew and the remaining jumpers said, sit down, don't touch any of your equipment. And so we broke formation, went back, landed at Pope. And the minute the ramp came open, there were CID, Criminal Investigation Division investigators standing there. And I looked at my safety NCO, uh, Ray Edgar, and I said, that kid died. I said, CID wouldn't be here if the kid didn't die. And so lo and behold, this young man exited the plane, had no lift capability, for whatever reason, did not pull his reserve parachute. And he went a thousand feet to his death and died of blunt force trauma. The reason I say it was the toughest, DJ, is because automatically, CID was there, okay, when it should have been, you know, an investigator from the division, from the Advanced Airborne School. And if they, in the, in the course of their investigation, found that there might be criminal activity associated with it, they handed over to CID. This was done ass backwards and automatically, right off the bat, me and my safety NCO, Ray Edgar, were on the defensive. Like CID was looking to see if we had done something criminal. Like we had cut this guy's static line or something, you know? And so we didn't even have time. The toughest part was we didn't even have time to mourn this young paratrooper who had died in a training accident because we were too busy defending ourselves. And finally, at one point, I told the investigators because, you know, we they wouldn't let us go home. We had to stay at our, our orderly room. We were sleeping on cots and everything. And finally, I told the investigators, I don't care what you do to me but I'm going to go to this memorial service for this young paratrooper because I wanted to show my respect and everything. But the hardest part was that, you know, I, I was so busy defending myself from what CID was telling us that I couldn't mourn this young paratrooper, you know? Now in the end, CID didn't find anything. It went to the 82nd. They did a 15, six inquiry. And in the end I was exonerated of all any wrongdoing and Natick, the uh, Army Research Lab, said that the, the cause was 
a catastrophic break of the jumper static line caused by him spinning out of the aircraft. So the kid hit his shoulder going out the door and it caused him to spin. And it just, you know, once in a lifetime, catastrophic break of a static line and everything. But that's why it was so tough because uh, I felt that, you know, I was being prosecuted right off the bat. I was guilty and I had to prove my innocence. Okay. Let's talk about one more combat thing. And then I want to get into your thoughts on mental health and things like that. Yeah. I want to talk about the worst day. We talked about it a little earlier, July 19th, 2007. Uh, you're moving from Taji past the city of Rashidia. Okay. A vehicle in the convoy was hit by an IED. Corporal Brandon Craig and Major Daniel Dudick were injured. Not only does this happen, as this chaos clears and you go back, you're informed that another soldier has been killed. Let's talk about yeah. that day and kind of your thoughts and how you mentally, because that's going to be our next part, push through it and help the others around you push through it. Again, this goes back. So here we are, Surge Brigade number four, going into Iraq. We're going to the northern Baghdad belt. Where, where there was a lot of heavy al-Qaeda in Iraq, enemy activity, and we knew that it was going to be a tough one. So there was a bit of crossing over again, you know. Um, you know, we all thought, hey, this is it. We're going for 15 months. Sooner or later, our number is going to come up. So you, 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 we've crossed over mentally and emotionally, even though every day we're fighting to stay alive, but more importantly, to win. And so... There's a bit of stoicism about everyone at that point, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I read a good book, you know, that the Marine Corps talks about called Rifleman Dodd. And it was about the Boer Wars back in the early 1800s, where this British soldier gets separated from his uh, unit and has to fight through enemy lines to get back. But in one of the pieces, you know, there are some fellow British troops that had been strung up by these Boer fighters and, uh, you know, they were hung from this pole and Rifleman Dodd in the book says, you know, to an average person that might seem like a spectacular event, but to someone like Dodd with his combat experience, it was just everyday life. So for us seeing shallow graves with Iraqi kids beheaded in it or seeing U.S. service members being maimed or, you know, an, an explosion causing a beautiful American human body turn into a pile of flesh, uh, camouflage material and hair. That was kind of what we had seen. And so, um, and we were accustomed to seeing that kind of stuff, you know? So death was all around us. Destruction, mayhem, and uh, maiming was all around us. So there's a bit of stoicism about that. <clears throat> so we were accustomed to it, but still, I mean, we're humans. So when 19 July happened, you know, and uh, again, here we were, we were moving on a patrol and it was my brigade commander and I, we were using artillery for ter terrain denial fires to deny the enemy access to where they could potentially do command detonated IEDs. But what we didn't notice was there was an explosive form penetrator that was in the ground and, uh, you know, that is IR operated. So the minute that they first vehicle hit that IR beam, it caused the detonation of that explosive form penetrator. And it basically vaporized Craig in the right air guard hatch. It knocks, it knocks the, the combat protective shield off of the striker. The blast was so forceful. And then shrapnel went through Craig and ended up in Dudex back in the same vehicle. And so, uh, you know, and then there's the ambush that happens with it. And, uh, I helped, uh, Doc, you know, my, the medic, uh, Sergeant First Class Charles Roberts, working on Dudek. Craig, even though we intubated him and everything and, and put a chest tube in him and everything, he was gone. So he was killed in action on the spot. But anyways, so we get Dudek, you know, my the guys get on the ground and they, you know, neutralize the, the threat. The QRF came out. We had helicopters overhead. And I, myself and two of my NCOs helped the uh, flight medic carry the do deck and a stretcher to get him evacuated. And that's when I realized there, when you talk about physically, mentally, and emotionally hard, how important PT is and how important 
being hydrated was because two of the NCOs that were on the stretcher with me were falling out from heat exhaustion. We get Dudek on the helicopter and everything, and we get back. We've got Craig zipped up in a body bag. And as we're moving back to Taji to the morgue to drop his body off and then have all of our guys that were uh, slightly wounded get checked out, I told myself, the enemy got us today. You know, and, and the conversation I had with my commander, John Lair, was, hey, you know, we didn't do anything necessarily wrong. The enemy got us. They get a vote. OK, I mean, what do you want us to say? We're, we're doing terrain denial fires. We're doing sweeping. You know, we had the, you know, the IED defeat team go out before us and everything. And so, uh, you know, and I knew that the next day we were going to have to go back out and get right back after it. And so that's when I pulled everybody together. And we got back and said, hey, look, the enemy got us today. All right. Doesn't mean we're a bad platoon. Doesn't mean we were doing things wrong, but they got us. But guess what, guys? We got to get our asses back out there tomorrow to show the enemy that we're not going to let them intimidate us. All right. So that's when I went back. Now the adrenaline is starting to wear off and I'm in my hooch and I'm starting to come down. And now I'm thinking Brandon Craig is gone. Danny and Mary Jane Craig back in Earlville, Maryland, his parents and Amber and Ryan, his brother and sister, pretty soon are going to get the worst call of their life. And it's not going to be from me. And it's not going to be anybody that is Brandon's friends. It's going to be somebody from the Department of the Army that is going to be calling them to tell them their son had been killed in action. So I sat in my, I was sitting in my hooch, kind of grieving a little bit when, you know, the, the knock at my door came. And it was at 1.30 in the morning. And when that knock came on the door at 1.30 in the morning, it was normally nothing good. And I opened it up and it was my operations NCO. And he said, hey, Sergeant Major, I just want to let you know we lost another guy. And uh, it was uh, Specialist Rhett Butler was killed by an IED in, in, uh, when he was in his driver's hatch and everything. And so now, you know, I'd already been kicked in the nutsack uh, with Craig, one of my guys killed. And now here's another guy killed. And so I knew then <clears throat> I got to strap it on tomorrow. As, as bad as this is right now, I got to strap it on. I got to be the example for resiliency here. Even though, you know, I'm hurting just as bad as everybody else, I knew that we still, this was day 99, DJ, and we had 366 more days to go before we could go home. And that we could not allow this spectacular event that killed one of our guy, or one of our guys and another guy killed, define who we were to the enemy. You know, I, I told myself, I'm going to continue to motivate these guys, and we're going to continue to get out and get after it. Now, don't get me wrong. You know, we had the combat stress team. We had the chaplain. We had all those folks there to assist those that, that needed it. But I wanted to make sure they understood that, hey, the, you know, defending freedom is not free. And, uh, and, and Brandon Craig gave his life for it. And in the end, when it was all said and done, we had 54 men and women that were killed in action. When I think of all the times that my boss and I had to go to the morgue to assist in identifying remains and to put combat decorations on them, more and more, that stoicism is what uh, got us through it, you know, and continued to focus us on the mission and getting after what we needed to do to defeat the enemy, but more importantly, to take care of the center of gravity, the Iraqi people, especially the children. You think you lose a piece of yourself with that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you leave a piece of yourself there. And I will tell you where this hit me at, DJ. When I left in 2008, the next time I went back to Iraq was 2016. Now, I went to Afghanistan 2011 and 12 and was the command sergeant major of ISAF Joint Command, who was in charge of all combat forces there. But I didn't go back to Iraq till 2016 when the chairman and I, General Dunford and I went. And I was the SEAC. Flying into that country and flying into Baghdad, you know, I had chills. You know, I was coming back to a place that I hoped I would never have to come back to it again. But plus, I knew I had left part of me here because 54 of my guys lost their lives there. And certainly a guy on my PTSD, Brandon Craig, was one of them. When I think about it, though, you went to all these spots. You were in Panama. You were in Iraq. You were in Afghanistan. And for someone 
or some place to stick out to you so much. It really shows on the backside of it. You know, you talk about you had to strap it on and get ready the next day. Your unit was responsible for 250 captured or killed high value targets. And you really put boot to ass after that happened. I understand the the drive to get back out there, but to put it to the enemy as hard as you did, does it help heal some of that wound? Absolutely. And when the men, when the troops, the men and women, when they see that we are executing methods, because what we did is we started getting out of our striker combat vehicles and we started doing what we called Raider Strike missions, which I talk about in there, where we would put a platoon in helicopters every night and have them go after bad terrorists. And we were chasing bad cell phones, you know, through signals, intelligence and everything. And... And the troops saw the momentum that we were creating and the initiative we had over the enemy and the impact we were having. And at the end, for the last three months, we didn't lose one soldier out of it. You know, we had some wounded and everything. But after April and until July, when we came home, we didn't lose one soldier. And guess what? The Iraqi security forces were doing a very good job with security of Bakuba and the outlining area. Kids were in school. Iraqi women were, you know, unscarved and everything, and they were living their lives the way they wanted to. Um, we had a huge impact. And that kind of stuff makes it all worthwhile when you see the impact you're having. And that absolutely helps to lessen the pain from losing good people in combat, even though you never lose that. But it helps ease it a little bit. I've said a lot in law enforcement, people can't understand until they've been there and done that. It's just not possible. Like you can tell the stories and you can tell where you've been and what you've done, but until people can see it with their own eyes, they, they don't understand it. And so the next part that I wanted to talk about was PME hard. You talking about maximizing yourself physically, mentally, emotionally, when you look at it, and you see the things that you've seen and you're you're inspiring the people that have seen the same kind of things as you what kind of motivation do you give them because it's hard to get back out there so like we just talked about you had to get back out the next day and put boot to ass how do you do that and how does this pme philosophy that you teach go into that the pme hard philosophy started during the surge in iraq and i saw how before the deployment I was using a lot of diverse training methods to get physically fit. And, you know, with the total body resistance exercise systems, other things, CrossFit and all this stuff, I was looking at different methods to get physically fit. And I noticed during Iraq that I'd be out on patrol with my guys in 130 degree heat with all of our equipment on and everything. And we would stand to do a security halt and I'd be on a knee against the wall and I would see some of my young soldiers that were standing up and they were bending over because, uh, you know, they, they didn't have a lot of core strength and that weight was killing them and everything. And I said, shit, I'm twice as old as these guys. So I knew then that I needed to focus on a physical fitness program that had a foundation that was physical, that maximized uh, the men and women's ability to be physically prepared for the, the challenges of combat, which would in turn allow them to be more mentally and emotionally resilient. And I think we all know, and, and you know, studies have shown that the more physically fit a person is, <clears throat> the more will build mental and emotional resiliency. Because if you are training hard to get ready for combat physically, you're dealing with adversity already. You know, and, and through the pain of getting through workouts and things like that, or long foot marches or or obstacle courses or whatever. And uh, and it builds on the mental and emotional resiliency. And the other thing was, because I knew the weather and the terrain were going to be issues as well, after when I started this program, that that was even more important, that it wasn't just the enemy, the weather and the terrain have huge issues mentally and emotionally on troops. So that's why I started this program. And it all starts with a, a basis of being maximizing physical fitness that builds on mental and emotional resiliency. But then it also means that it's okay that if mentally and emotionally, 
you know, physically, if you're having challenges, you got a bad back or something, certainly you're going to go to the doctor and get checked out. Mentally and emotionally, we got to get it to that it's okay if something's not right, that it's okay to go see somebody. We're not going to hold it against you because you're not feeling right and everything. And so that was kind of the concept. And the reason I used hard is because when I saw the insidious enemies, we were fighting in Iraq. And the ones, you know, that I had been engaged in direct combat with, you know, that you couldn't just be strong and you couldn't be tough. You had to be hard. You had to be the exact opposite of soft. And you, you had to have, you know, stone-like resiliency about you. And, and I go back to 19 July, you know, when we lost Craig and then we lost Rhett Butler. And then it was a couple of days later, we lost another soldier and everything. You know, resiliency is all about being hard uh, during hard times. The question that comes to mind with that then is when you say it's all right, if you're not all right, it's okay to seek out help. I think we can both agree, even in the the position that you've been in, whether we're talking military, law enforcement, first responders, that approach was not the norm. No, it's when, not. When people seek yeah. help, they were thought of as weak. They were worried about losing their job, maybe their position. Why did it become so important to you? And that's how we're going to kind of grow into the SEAC and what you did there. Well, because I, I saw the, what the toll had on some, you know, <clears throat> on my soldiers. And then when I saw our most elite special operations unit units creating this preservation of the force and fitness that gets after the total uh, soldier, total warrior concept and getting after mental and emotional kind of stuff and everything. And I said, if our most elite special operators are normalizing uh, behavioral and, and mental health, then why are we doing it? Why is there still a stigma with us? And that's why I, I got on this kick about getting after that, you know, because, you know, if a guy in, or a gal is out in combat in the Hindu Kush in Afghanistan and physically they're in pretty good shape, but their emotions and mentally they're kind of sideways and everything, they could potentially be a liability on the battlefield, left untreated. But with treatment and normalcy, they can still be an effective member of that team and be lethal and be ready and be victorious in combat if we give them the right level of treatment and everything. Just like if I've got a torn meniscus in my knee and I'm still humping up that Hindu Kush, all right, and all of a sudden we get ambushed and we've got a fire maneuver, and I can't run, I'm a liability potentially, okay? So that's, that's the way I looked at it. And again, when I first started off with this DJ, there was a lot of naysayers, you know, like you were saying and everything, that people thought, oh, you're, you're trying to give people, you know, the easy way out. I said, no, I'm not. I'm trying to build the overall and have a holistic approach on being ready to fight and win. And that's physically, mentally, and emotionally, we've got to be at peak operating capability. Let's talk about a couple of the things. About a month ago, I did a show on mental health and the, the suicide epidemic that is just out of control. The guys that I had on, I had two Green Berets, two Navy SEALs, pretty high ranks on both of them. And a, a couple of the issues that we talked about were a problem that they had was when a soldier needs to get better and get back out into the fight, a, a big problem was medication. And one of the guys that we had on there, he had seizures. So they gave him a seizure medicine. And then to counteract that seizure medicine, because it made psychotic behaviors, they gave him this. And that made him tired. So they gave him this. And by the end, he was taking six medications to take that one seizure medication. I want to hear your thoughts on, is that a problem in the military? Is that a problem in veteran services? Is there an over-prescription? Is there an over-medication of the force? Uh, there definitely was through the formative years of the global war on terrorism. I mean, it, to the point that we were standing up pain management commands and everything to deal with physical and, uh, and mental pain and everything. But then it started getting out of hand, the overprescriptions that you described. And next thing you know, you had service members on 12 different medications and everything. So we've gotten smarter about that now and looking for alternative methods 
to get after this, okay? And, you know, one of the tenets of PME Hard that I use comes from the movie Shawshank Redemption when Morgan Freeman said, get busy living or get busy dying. And so I think our active duty force is not uh, over-medicated as much. There's still some of those cases out there, but we've gotten better at alternative methods, neuromuscular health and things like this to treat as opposed to medicate. But in the veteran community, I think it is still rampant. And I think, uh, you know, there's 20 million Americans that are veterans out there, and we have numerous ones that are extremely over-medicated. But I will tell you this, DJ, we have a lot of veterans out there that aren't living healthy lives either. You know, they're, they're not exercising every day, and that, even if that's just walking, they're not doing anything productive. They've kind of lost purpose in everything. And, and that's when, you know, things start going downhill. And if you throw in self-medication along with drug and alcohol abuse and firearms, then it could be a very bad ending. So what I'm doing, you know, I'm the national ambassador for the VFW. And I talk all the time is we got to get busy living instead of get busy dying. Okay. It's okay to have our canteens at our VFW posts and have a beer and tell war stories. But if that is all we do there, then we are just giving people uh, a reason to get get busy dying, all right? We got to promote healthy lifestyles. And I hear it all the time. Well, I'm trying to get 100% on my VA disability claim. Well, that doesn't mean you have to be unhealthy, all right? If you have service-connected injuries or illnesses or something like that, that you have evidence that shows that these were service-connected, you're going to get compensated for it. OK, you don't have to make yourself unhealthy to maximize your VA disability claim. So I think there is a lot of that happening in our veteran community. And that is a contributing factor to why we have this out of control suicide rate with our veterans. And we've just got to continue to focus on, hey, look, brother, I'm 100 percent plus disabled veteran. But I still exercise every day, even though, you know, it hurts to get out of bed in the morning and everything. I make sure I do something to take care of myself physically every day, you know, and I'm smarter about how I train because I'm getting older. Um, but uh, again, I don't want my grandchildren to have to push me around in a wheelchair, brother. So, and again, I'm not passing judgment on anybody. I'm just saying that the more I take care of myself, the better husband, the better father, the better grandfather I'll be. And certainly with what I'm doing post-military life, the better asset I'll be to the organizations that I'm working for and with. Okay. So with all of that, let's talk about alternative therapies. There's physical fitness, there's red light therapy, there's cryotherapy. I would like to hear your thoughts on the, the secondary alternative therapies like the ketamine treatments, the stellate ganglion block, all of these different things. Why do you think it's so hard to bring those? Because those are, I think we can agree. Those are still kind of fringe therapies what is taking so long to bring them into being primary therapies legacy thinking on behalf of providers and, and i'll give you an example so i do not do physical therapy through the va anymore i do neuromuscular therapy at an athletic training institute right up the road here all right which is not just showing me methods you know, to build my muscles, it is getting after the muscle, nerve, bone connection and, and getting through that. And it has had huge impact on me where before, because of the arthritis in my feet and in my knees, it hurt to walk and certainly running wasn't, you know, I, I, I was able to run, but it hurt like hell. Now I'm walking and running pain free, even though, you know, being, you know, after getting out of bed, after sleeping all night, I still stiff in the morning and everything. But when I, when I go around and talk to people about these alternative therapies, there are so many people in the medical community that haven't been educated on those. So they're skeptical on it. And then, oh, by the way, they want, you know, some kind of study that's been done on it, you know, or, you know, some doctor has, you know, verified it or whatever. We are so risk averse in terms of seeking new and innovative ways at treating. And we are so focused on legacy thinking. I will tell you, going to the VA 
and don't, don't get me wrong, great Americans, the physical therapist here, but giving me a strap, you know, to do exercises did nothing for the injuries I had because they weren't addressing the issue. The issue for me was the nerve connection to the muscles and the bones that weren't being addressed. And now through this muscle activation techniques, this neuromuscular health, I am getting physical therapy type stuff along with stimulation, electrical stimulation that is addressing the nerves and the, and the muscles and the bones all together. And it's having a much more dynamic impact. And the other ones that you talked about for the same reasons, I hear it all the time. Well, you know, this is, this is the budget we have and everything. And I'm like, BS, I was in the Pentagon. I know how much money we would give back at the end of the year. So innovative ways at getting after this our special operations community do it does it very well all right but the general purpose force gets caught up in legacy thinking and if you have a physical therapist that has been with an organization for 20 years trying to get them to think outside the box and look for more innovative ways that they haven't been trained on they won't be an advocate for that kind of stuff they will want to say this is how we've always done it let's continue to do this and i've seen that firsthand and that's why all of these innovations don't get introduced and don't get adopted because of legacy thinking. All right. I want to save therapy for the very last thing that we talk about. Let's talk about okay. what we came here for. Let's talk about you being the SEAC. It's, it's this job or it's retirement. That's, that's the way you looked at it. What did it mean to you to work for General Dunford? Oh, it was nirvana. It was absolutely the best officer and the best boss I ever worked for. And I've had some great ones in Mike Scaparotti, you know, who I worked for three times, uh, three different assignments, I'm sorry, as his Sergeant Major and everything. Uh, John Lair, there's been a lot of them. But Dunford was the consummate professional. But more importantly, Dunford had never forgotten where he came from. He always looked through things through the lens of, you know, he's a Marine, so second lieutenant or a Lance Corporal. You know, even though he was his job was to provide best military advice to the president and he always included me in his decision making. He always made sure that I was a part of everything he did. And he made sure that he made it <laughs> very clear that when you went into that joint staff conference room, he sat at the head of the table. I sat right on his right because I was his right hand man. And then all the other generals were down the table, you know, and the vice chairman was on this side with all the other generals down here. But he made sure that I was at a place that showcased exactly what I meant to him. And then when we would go around the world together, he was always the guy that included me in everything. And I will tell you the best thing about him, DJ, he was the consummate apolitical military leader. He refused to let politics or anything else get in his way of doing his duties. And he did not allow anybody to ask him questions that were not within his bailiwick as the chairman. So if somebody was saying, would ask a question, well, what do you think about, you know, the president of this country and everything? He would immediately go back to, well, this is what we're looking at with their military here. He would, he, he would say it in such a way as, you know, the things he wasn't saying was, okay, I'm not the president of the United States, so I'm not going to comment on the other na another nation's president, all right? But I will tell you about their military and how I interface with their chief of defense, who is my counterpart, all right? He was such a master at that, at staying apolitical and not doing anything. And here was the other thing with that guy. He caught flack like any other military leader on social media, in the news and stuff like that. And he used what I loved, an extinction response. He just wouldn't respond to that kind of stuff. He would not give people a platform to say that he's arguing and bickering and everything. And I see too many general officers and flag officers nowadays, especially on social media and especially on Twitter, that want to get into these back and forth arguments with people from academia or just some shithead from nowhere in Nebraska, you know, or something that they'll get into an argument because the guy said something bad about soldiers and pretty soon, and you've seen it, there's been some generals that get in trouble with that shit. Dunford made it fun. Dunford kept it professional. And there was never, not once in the 43 months that I was with him, 
that he did something or say something that could potentially be political or contentious to any either side of the, the aisle. Well, here's the interesting part. You bring that up apolitical. And, and tell me if I'm wrong, but I, I think I read it pretty right. There was a difference in you in the presidents that you worked under. Would you agree? Absolutely. And, and so when I read it, I wanted to know what was the difference? Because he was so apolitical. He made it such an idea to stay away from that stuff but you kind of saw through the bullshit, the smoke and mirrors of what was going on and saw it for a different thing. And you even brought up as small as taking pictures with the president. So, you know, I mean, spending 38 years in the military, you become a pretty good judge of character, you know, and, uh, and, you know, and I know when somebody really gives a shit about me or whether they're like, this is just an inconvenience for me, you know? And, uh, and I say it in the book, you know, I don't know what was going on with President Obama at that time. I had never had a crossword with the guy. Uh, I first met him when I was the sergeant major at IJC in Afghanistan, and he came to visit and everything. And, and he was pretty cordial there. Maybe it was because it was the last year that he was in office, uh, you know, eight year eight of his eight year presidency. I don't know what it was, but uh, the event was Memorial Day 2016. And it was labeled Memorial Day breakfast with the president and first lady. So Sandra and I are excited, you know, hey, we're going to be with the president and the first lady. You know, we get over there and the first lady was a no show. I don't know what was going on, you know, um, but she didn't show up. And then the president didn't even come in and work the, the room or sit down and talk or have breakfast or anything. He just went to a side room and we were told, well, the president's only here to take pictures. So if you want to get a picture, line up over here. So Sandra and I decided to do that. And uh, while we were in line, one of his aides came, was coming up and telling us, don't talk to him. Don't start a conversation. Don't try to give him a coin. Don't do anything. Take your picture and move out. And I looked at Sandra. We were like, well, that's pretty impersonal. You know, I mean, you know, just come in, take a picture and move out. So I got the attitude of that's bullshit. I'm going to talk to my president. All right. <laughs> and uh, again, he, he had no idea who I was never once in all the times, the events that I went to that one year under him, did he even recognize me as the SEAC or whatever, you know, we go back there and, and uh, you know, we shake hands with him, get ready to take a picture. And I said, yeah, I just want you to know I'm general Dunford's Sergeant major. And he goes, well, Joe, Joe Dunford's a great man. He kept talking about Dunford. Meanwhile, this little aide is telling me, all right, sir, don't talk to the president. Just get, take your picture and everything. And, I'm, and he's, he's starting to piss me off, this little feller, you know. And finally, <laughs> after we take the picture, he's like, all right, move out. Finally, I said, all right, dude, I'm going, okay. And, uh, you know, I just kind of did it like that. And that's why I said, I said, man, I, I want to kick the shit out of this guy right here. And that's why I say in the book. That aide will never know how close he came to getting a West End Davenport ass beaten right there in front of the president of the United States because he was such a prick, you know. And then I go to President Trump a year, you know, well, not even a year later, you know. It was during his inauguration. You know, nobody gave us any rules about Trump. You know, when I first met Trump, uh, when he was president-elect at the Army-Navy game, we were up in Oliver North's uh, skybox to meet the president elect, General Dunford and I, we had our wives with us. So Sandra was with me and everything and, you know, and he was pretty cordial. And then the night of the inauguration, the military ball, the chairman had myself and the service senior enlisted kind of run it. And we we're lined up to take pictures with President Trump and, and the first lady. And nobody gave us any rules about Trump. So I gathered all the senior enlisted together and said, hey, look, nobody told us anything about we can't talk to him or anything. I said, how about all of us give him a coin when we go in? There? And so they all agreed. So the chairman and all the chiefs went in and got their pictures. So Sandra and I were the first enlisted to go in. And I walked in and the first thing President Trump says is, hey, you're that SEAC guy, aren't you? The one I met at Army Navy. I said, yes, sir. He goes, you're the senior enlisted guy in the force, right? And I said, yes, sir. And he goes, I expect you to give me the pulse of the force. I said, I will, Mr. President. And I shook his hand and I gave him a coin and he goes, oh, thanks. And he puts it in his pocket. 
Melania is talking to Sandra and everything, and we're having a little chat. And then we take our picture, and then we walk out. And as we walked out, there was Don Jr., Eric Trump, Ivanka, Kushner, her husband, and the rest of the family. And we had great, splendid conversations with them. They were very open and everything. And so as every senior enlisted came out from every service with their spouse, I asked them, did you give them a coin? They said, yeah, every one of them. So that seven senior enlisted went through and every one of them gave Trump a coin. So when Trump came out to go down and address the crowd and he and uh, Melania come walking out, that dude had so many coins in his pockets, his pockets were jingling <laughs> when he went down there. He didn't give them to an aide or anything. And so then, you know, we think, okay, he's got these coins in his pockets. They'll end up in some aide's hands and whatever. Three weeks later, I was in my office in the Pentagon. I'm watching the news, and it's President Trump at his phone in the Oval Office. And behind him, he's got a coin rack. And as I look closer, I saw on the bottom row was my coin and every other service senior enlisted coin. The first coins he got as President of the United States was from me and the service senior enlisted, and he was so proud of it. He got a coin rack, and those were the coins on the bottom row there. I said, now that's class right there. You know, he truly gave a shit, you know. There wasn't any of this just, you know, smoke and mirrors or anything like that. And that's the first thing that told me, okay, I can respect this guy. because he. And every time we would go to the, an event at the White House, he would go out of his way to come and shake my hand, you know. And, you know, whether it was uh, the Commander-in-Chief Trophy presentation to the winning, you know, Military Academy football team or whatever, he would come to the audience and shake hands and he would always come up to me, you know, and, hey, Siak, how you doing, you know, and everything. So that had a huge impact on me because it showed respect, you know. You know, I mean, you, you can imagine, you know, especially a guy like me, when I got some aide yelling in my ear, shut up, just move out, you know, and everything. And the president, you know, is just allowing this guy to do that. And I'm like, well, shit, you know, is this how things happen over here? I mean, thankfully, I never had to go back because uh, I probably would have kicked the shit out of a few people. <laughs> so. I want to tell you, first off, your Trump voice impression, spot on. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's talk about a couple of the bad things that happened uh, when you were in SEAC. This is where emotions truly kind of started flaring up. I want to read you a passage out of there and then we can talk about it. this, of course, is the E-Tool incident. It says U.S. forces are under orders to defeat ISIS. So they have two options. They can surrender or die. If they choose to surrender, we will safeguard them to their detainee holding facility, provide them chow, a cot, and due process. If they choose not to surrender, then we will kill them with extreme prejudice, either through our partnered security forces, dropping bombs on them, shooting them in the face, or beating them to death with our entrenching tools. Either way, it is their decision. It's a fantastic speech, first off. Number two... When you saw the flack and the blowback that you got from it, were you worried? Were you concerned? Not, I'm not talking about if you would be in trouble. Were you concerned that this is our job? This is what I've dedicated 30 years of my life to, and we're talking about it as a party joke. Two things. So when I, when I got sworn in as the SEAC, retired General Martin Dempsey, who was former chairman, told me that I had to give this SEAC job irreversible momentum. So, and then Dunford, you know, telling me the troops would tell him whether I was doing a good job or not. He said, I have to showcase to the troops who I am. And, you know, when you're the Sergeant Major of the Army of the other service, you have Title 10 authority. You can do uniform changes. You can do tangible stuff. As the SEAC, because the chairman focus is best military advice to the president, along with the Secretary of Defense, that, you know, I didn't have any authority. So all I had was the art of influence, the art of inspiration, the art of leadership that had to showcase to the force on who I was and what I was. And one of the first meetings I went after getting sworn in, I went to the White House, you know, and this doesn't happen very often, but I went to a deputy subcommittee group meeting that was about uh, different ways to uh, prevent people from joining terrorist organizations like ISIS. And this one staffer there, I was having a conversation, said, <laughs> and I still laugh to this day, she says, well, maybe if we give them jobs, they won't want to be terrorists. And I thought to myself, 
this is what's wrong right here. We don't understand. We think that these terrorists in Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan are driven by poverty. Some of them are, don't get me wrong, but the vast majority, the overwhelming majority are drawn by radical ideology. And until we address the radical ideology, we're still going to get after it. So, so the point was, and my point to her was, if we give them a job or we give them money, they're going to find more innovative ways to kill us and to kill innocent people. And so then as I continued on getting, you know, educated on my first year there, I was a little concerned that we in Washington, D.C. truly weren't understanding the challenges that our troops faced in Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, Yemen, Libya, Niger, and places like that. And in, when Mattis came in, in, in January of 2017, first thing he said to me was, Sergeant Major, we're not going to talk about defeating our enemies. We are going to annihilate them. And he said, get the word out that we are going to annihilate our enemies. And so that was what the talking point, you know, that, hey, we're not just going to defeat any threats to the United States. We're going to annihilate them. We're going to obliterate them off the planet. And you know how Mattis is. He was just a, a very, very motivational, inspirational guy. And along with Dunford's leadership, it was absolutely the best two years of my time. And so I knew that I needed to send an inspirational message that would complement what the chairman and secretary were saying. And so I was in Iraq, or excuse me, Syria, Raqqa, Syria, during the fighting in Raqqa, which ultimately led to the fall of the ISIS caliphate. And I saw how resilient ISIS was. You know, we were, our Syrian Democratic Forces, being advised by our Special Operations Forces, were kicking the shit out of ISIS. But the minute there'd be a lull in the fight, out would come a female suicide vest bomber or a vehicle-borne improvised explosive device or something. They were a very resilient enemy. And I was on the roof of this building with uh, this very elite unit Sergeant Major. Rob was his name. And, and I just said out loud, I said, you know what? These assholes have two options. They could surrender or die. And he goes, well, what do you mean by that? And so I said, you know, you know, just the quote you described. And I had been having this conversation with another elite uh, special operator from the unit, a guy named George. And we were talking about, you know, the entrenching tool, you know, as a weapon and everything. And so I just blurted it out there and said, or if need be, we'll beat them to death with our entrenching tools. And so he told me, you ought to put that in your report to Chairman Dunford and Secretary Mattis. So I did. And uh, Mattis wrote back to me and said, keep saying that because that fits right into the narrative of annihilate the enemy. And it was never an issue, DJ, never an issue wherever I went. It was all meant to inspire the troops and showcase to them that we in Washington, D.C. hadn't forgotten about the hard things that they were doing in some of these, you know, countries and everything. And it wasn't a problem until Christmas Day uh, at, in 2017, when I was on a USO tour with G General Dunford, and I'm on a stage firing up troops, and General Dunford's on the stage with me, Medal of Honor recipient Captain Flo Groberg is on the stage with me, and he and I are holding entrenching tools. And I, I kind of said the quote, and there was a Washington Post reporter in the audience. And afterwards, a guy comes up to me, and if you know the Washington Post, you know they lean in a certain direction. And uh, the guy says to me, well, you just told the troops to go out and commit war crimes. I said, no, I didn't. I said, we teach soldiers, Marines, and battlefield airmen how to use non-standard weapons to kill. And he said, well, I'm going to go public with this. And initially I said, well, knock yourself out. But then I thought about it and was like, oh, shit, where, where could this thing go? So I called up my trusty public affairs advisor, now Master Sergeant Retired Rob Couture, and I said, Rob, Got an issue. This Washington Post reporter said this. What should we do? And he said, let's beat him to the punch. So he had me send him a photo from the chairman's photographer of me holding an entrenching tool with the troops talking to him. And he put the quote with the picture and he put it all over social media. And we did it just to show that this Washington Post reporter couldn't sensationalize my comments. Well, those posts went viral. I mean, all over the world. The good thing was the troops loved it. They saw the video of me saying this. They saw my words and everything. 
and I was getting messages from around the world saying thank you. The French media, the German media, all kinds of international media picked it up and everything. Hell, the Stars of Strife put me on the cover of it saying top NCO gives ISIS ultimatum and everything. And ISIS even started talking smack to me on their uh, French propaganda webpage. So we started <laughs> talking smack back to them, you know. But in the end, Washington, D.C., when I got back wasn't from that overseas trip, wasn't as friendly as it was before. And that's when the, the comments started coming out. Hey, you know, since when do enlisted talk like that, you know, and you're supposed to be seen and not heard and all this stuff. In the end, DJ, General Dunford and Secretary Mattis never had a problem with what I said. Never once did they come to me and say, I don't want you to say that or anything. And then people started telling me, you need to walk this back. And I said, I'm not walking it back, okay? I'm not apologizing for anything. I said, if you got a problem, that four-star general down there, go talk to him or that Secretary of Defense upstairs because I am echoing their comments. But then, you know, that, like I said, all of a sudden things weren't the same. And, and then I could tell that people were looking to either bring me down a notch or do something to me. And that's when I end up getting uh, suspended. Well, and I think that goes to my point and kind of my question when I said, were you worried after you said it and you hear that this happens in this incident or investigate, whatever you want to call it, were you worried that you had spent your whole life portraying this life, doing this, and people were undermining it? Because, I mean, let's be real. That's what they were doing. They were undermining you. They were undermining the position. And they were undermining our stance in the world. Yeah, but, you know, the bottom line, DJ, what made it worth it is the troops loved it. And it motivated the troops and inspired the troops. Brother, to this day, I have now signed 5,066 entrenching tools. As a matter of fact, I signed two more yesterday. And if saying something like that inspired men and women in uniform to go out and do great things or reach their untapped potential, even though it caused me, it started me down this road where I ended up suspended for six months, then it was worth it. And I have zero regrets, uh, even though it sucked being suspended you know, and everything and, and not and being uncertain as what was going to happen. But in the end, I wouldn't change anything because it did exactly what I hoped it would do and inspired the troops. But more importantly, it got after, you know, what the SEAC is supposed to do, which is to bring inspiration, purpose, motivation to the joint force on behalf of the chairman and the secretary of defense. We've kind of beat around the bush the whole night about it. Let's talk about this suspension. I want to read these out. Tell me if there's any more that I need to add. So the suspension of the SEAC. First off, I want to point out, they didn't tell you any of this. They just gave you a phone call, said to meet here, that you were suspended, and that they would be in touch with you later on. Not to talk to Dunford, not to talk to Mass, not to talk to any of your staff. Just go away, take some leave for a while, and we'll be in contact with you. When it finally comes down, the charges are fostering an unhealthy climate, hostile workforce, uh, un unauthorized gifts, unauthorized travel, uh, misused staff for non-official duties, and then product promotion that wasn't mm -hmm. part of the government. Let's talk about this, and let's talk about you proving a point, saying you were radioactive at the time. You went to your cubicle. You had support, but a lot of the people that you thought might come around to help backed away from you real quick like you were exploding oh yeah you know whenever something like that happens to you like that you are guilty before you are innocent that you know the the military the government whoever they can say oh no you're innocent until proven guilty when it comes to an administrative investigation like that you have to prove that you are not guilty <clears throat> and in that case that at that level they went through me with a fine tooth comb and, you know, the investigating officers from the inspector general office that I thought were going to kind of be objective and everything they did. Uh, I could tell the, the level of questioning was prove us wrong, prove this wrong. Okay. Prove this wrong, you know, and they'll, they'll say, no, we are we're being objective and you are innocent until proven guilty. I think in my opinion, it's all bullshit. And, and especially when it comes to an enlisted guy like me, you get treated differently than a general officer does. 
All right. So when I went through this process, you know, I was not going to give the bastard or bastards that filed the complaint against me to get the satisfaction. And so I, I was hanging it out. I was doing PT every day, coming into that cubicle every day. But I would walk down that hallway and people that I would thought were my friends, they used to say hi to me all the time, or at least I had a, a professional relationship with. All of a sudden, it was like they were walking down the hallway. Ooh, look at that nice art on the wall. I never knew it was there and everything. They were doing anything and everything to make sure they didn't have to talk to me. And then the, the key thing was when you get into a situation like that where you are powerless because you are paralyzed because of an investigation, people want to exploit it, you know, and uh, and, and want to start talking to you like, uh, you know, you're a, a second class citizen and everything. And I never forgot any of that stuff, DJ. I said, OK, mental note. I got it because I was confident I was coming back because I knew that a lot of this was bullshit, you know, and and it was uh, one guy that was a 60 percenter, a mediocre performer who didn't like that. I was, you know, trying to get them to up their game. You know, it was an E9 getting run over by my E7s and E8s, you know, and I wanted this guy to excel and everything and he didn't want to do it. He wanted to get maximum reward for minimal performance. You know, that's that's kind of what happened. And it took a guy, Pat Work, who's, uh, you know, about to be uh, a two star general and, and a future division commander who I had served in combat before. He was walking down the hallway in very loud and boisterous in a hallway full of people. He says, there you go. See, come here. Come here. I know people around here think you're radioactive, but I'm going to give you a hug to show them that you're not radioactive. Dude, that had such a huge impact on me because he didn't care what anybody in that audience or in that hallway thought in that very busy E-wing of the Pentagon where the joint staff is, the chairman's office, vice chairman's office. He was going to let it be known that he still loved me. And, and those kinds of things had a huge impact on me throughout that six months. Is there ever anger? Oh, Yeah. You go through the gamut of emotions. You're pissed off. Like, why didn't this punk motherfucker have the balls to come and face me face to face? He was such, you know, excuse my language, he was a punk bitch that didn't have the intestinal fortitude that if there was something wrong, would come and face me, you know? And instead, he has to go to the inspector general. And I firmly believe that there was at least one general officer and one lawyer that was coaching him on how to file this complaint. And they were all in the same service, by the way. And it wasn't my service, you know, the army. And then he, he puts it, he doesn't even, doesn't even have the balls to put his name on the complaint. So he files it anonymously. And, uh, th you know, eventually I found out who it was, you know, but, um, yeah, I was angry. I was, you know, the first few days I was feeling sorry for myself, you know, because I had done all of this stuff over, which was 36 plus years at the time. And I had been, we had a lot of momentum in the office of the SEAC and everything. And I'm thinking to myself, why would somebody do this to me? Nobody ever came to me, you know? But then as I thought about it, this was, this was the kind of things this guy was doing. Okay. Just to give you a snippet of what I was dealing with. So every time the president would come to the Pentagon to get a brief, it was standard that we would recognize 50 troops with presidential coins. And with Mattis, he was very particular. E6 and below only, and no fatties, he would say. So anybody that looked remotely fat, we had to send back. And so I was in the meetings with the president. So I put this guy in charge of getting all 50 people squared away. And when I came out with the president and the chairman and the sec def, this guy as an E9 had positioned himself at the end of the formation to receive a coin. And as we got down to the ends of the formation, I noticed Mattis saw the guy's rank and he looked at me and I said, hey, I'll take care of it, Mr. Secretary. And so I brought that guy into my office afterwards and I said, what the hell did you not understand about the SecDef saying only E6 and below? 
And this is what he says to me. He says, well, I was in charge of getting these 50 guys lined up, so I felt I deserved a reward for doing that. I said, dude, you're an E9 in the military for over 30 years. And if you need a reward like that for, put, for putting together a formation, you're in the wrong business and you need to retire. You know, and then it was a couple weeks later, this guy, <laughs> it's getting ready to be a four day week. This is right before I got suspended. It's a four day weekend, uh, Labor Day, 2018. And, uh, I'm getting ready to go on a round the world trip. We're doing a lap around the globe with the sec def and the chairman, and we're leaving on that Saturday. So this guy comes in and I always traveled with one of my NCOs that was with me, you know, um, the chairman would have a team of 20, but I would have one NCO that was with me that would help me with all my engagements and everything. And normally whenever we traveled, we'd have somebody else on the team drive us to the airfield uh, to get on the plane with the chairman and everything over to Andrews Air Force Base. So this guy comes to me and says, hey, uh, we're going to, you know, have uh, the guy going with you drive the vehicle over and we'll have you park it there at the VIP area and uh, we'll come back and get it on Tuesday. And I said to myself, first of all, I said, do you think the chairman does business like that? Do you think they say, well, we'll just park the chairman's vehicles there over the weekend? I said, why are we deviating away from our SOP, our standard operating procedure? And he says to me, well, I don't want people to work this weekend. I said, okay, instead of having the driver drive us, you drive us, okay? And give everybody else the four-day weekend. I said, and you drive us. Well, guess what? He never showed up on Saturday to drive us. He made the driver drive us. So the bottom line is he didn't want his four-day weekend disrupted, and he wanted to mask it by saying, we'll change the SOP so I don't have to have the driver come in and I feel guilty about it. You know, it was it was so self-centered. And so I had cleared the office and I just ripped this guy's ass. And that was on around Labor Day of 2018. On 26 September 2018, I got suspended. Well, he was definitely waiting for that. That That's for oh, yeah. sure. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about how that ended up, um, what what actually they, they proved. And then yeah. I want to talk about you getting out of the military and some of the stuff that you did, because I think it holds true for a lot of guys that are leaving a life of service. Yeah. So uh, when it was all said and done on the uh, 29th of March, 2018, I got the results of the investigation and of the six charges, four were unsubstantiated or dismissed. And the two that were substantiated, uh, one was a that I had Im implied endorsement of a non-federal entity, which uh, happened in Scotland. I was on a uh, on a uh, hike in the Scottish Highlands with a bunch of wounded, ill and injured U.S. and NATO troops and the celebrity was there. Robert Irvine, good friend of mine, you know, from Restaurant Impossible and just just a phenomenal supporter of the military. And Robert had given Fit Crunch bars, Robert Irvine's Fit Crunch bars to everybody that was there, thousands of them. And so the PAO decides, hey, let's do a video talking about this hike. So he and I go on there and he talks about what the Cataran Yomp, the, you know, doing the hike with the wounded, ill and injured means and everything. And at the end, I said, hey, this guy gave us a fit crunch bar. We're ready to get after it. So, and, and under my initial investigation, this wasn't a part of anything. But the investigator had went back in and dug through all my social media and everything and found this video. And he sends me a note and says, I was re-examining evidence and I found this video. He says, explain this. I said, okay, the dude gave fit crunch bars to everybody. Okay. And all I was saying is he said, well, it sounds to me like you needed that fit crunch, fit crunch bar to get through the hike. I said it was 54 miles in 24 hours. I would have needed a warehouse full of those fit crunch bars. All right. Anyways, they substantiated that. And then, you know, I would buy chow for my staff or one of my staff would go to the store and say, Hey, do you want anything SEAC? And I would say, Hey, here's $20 get something for me, get something for you, get something for anybody else. And then when he would come back, I'd tell him to keep the change and everything. It was inappropriate use of staff. So I said, okay, I'm guilty on both accounts. I, I acknowledge that I'm guilty. 
So when I went in to get my adjudication with the chairman, you know, he wrote me a, uh, a, a general officer memorandum of record saying, hey, these you were held, found guilty of these two charges. But what he wrote in there was, you, you are reprimanded for these two actions. This reprimand will be filed in your local file. And when I re relinquish duties as the chairman will be destroyed. So the bottom line is, he wrote me a counseling statement and said, hey, don't do it again. And I was reinstated and told to go back to work. So all of this sensationalization that started with me calling out our enemies and everything that took us down this road of what I call professional jealousy by others and had me for six months sitting on my ass. And in the end, I get a little counseling statement. I get put back to work and I finish out my year plus as the SEAC. So that was the adjudication of it. And you know something, DJ, when I left the chairman's office that day and was finally able to go back into my own office after six months, I said, I'm not going to change my leadership style at all. I'm not going to change who I am or what I am. I'm going to remain authentic. I'm going to remain genuine, but I'm going to be more cognizant of my inner circle because it was my, that person in my inner circle that not only tried to fissure the irreversible momentum that we had in the, in the SEAC position, but also thought that if they could get rid of me, they potentially could take my job, you know? Well, and one final thing on that, people should understand too, that not only did you have to watch who your inner circle was with what they did in dismantling your office, you had to rebuild your entire inner circle. And as a matter of fact, that first day I went back, DJ, I was an army of one. It was me. My staff, they had dismantled and sent them back to service. So I had to rebuild my team, and I eventually did, and I had a great team after that. But it was clear to me that people were trying to get rid of me and get rid of the position. Um, and again, when you, have, when you are that forceful and willful in what you're doing, and you have the confidence of your bosses, that intimidates people, and that intimidates general and flag officers, too, that aren't uh, of the same ilk that you are. All right, let's talk about retirement. This was probably the most, I guess you would say, touching or emotional part of the book. With everything that you had talked about, people think that it couldn't get. So you tell your wife, hey, retirement's coming up. I'm going to get out of here. This is what we're going to do. And she tells you, point blank, you're an angry man. You've been angry for a long time. And if you don't get it fixed, I'm not going to be around. Now, what was amazing about this was she had been around 38 years when this all came up. And she's telling you, after all that, after everything we've been through, all the separation, if you don't get fixed, I'm not going to live with you. So initially I was in denial that I thought anything was wrong with me. And then initially, and then after that, I made the decision because I, I there was no way I was going to allow my wife to get away from me that I said, I'll appease her by going to make an appointment at DiLorenzo Clinic in the Pentagon there. And uh, so initially I, I went just to appease Sandra, but uh, I got in there, my provider at the time, she was, uh, it felt like she was ripping my head open and she was reading my brain. She knew exactly what was going on with me. She knew exactly, you know, the anger that I had. And, and it was all... <clears throat> the anger of the loss of soldiers, you know, the, the combat wound, it was all combat related. Why I was saying the hypersensitivity that I had and everything and being easily startled and all of that, it was all combat related, but I didn't truly understand it at the time. And so the next time I went in, she diagnosed me with PTSD and then we started the therapy and all of a sudden I started feeling better. And I started feeling better and I started feeling better about myself. And I knew then all of a sudden it was like a drug. I was addicted this once a month or once a week at the time going in and talking to this therapist. Now it's once a month. And I just feel like a million dollars when I come out with that. So the hardest thing it did for me or for me to do was one to acknowledge I had it. But then two, I thought to myself, if I've been this angry for over 30 years, then you know, my three sons probably caught a lot of the brunt. And that's when I sat down and I wrote a letter to my boys and I attached a book 
why is dad so mad to it so that they can understand that uh, PTSD is a reality and uh, and unfortunately your dad has it and uh, and I just wanted to apologize for potentially being a jerk at times that I didn't need to be a jerk. Did you find that that was more therapeutic for you or for the family as a whole? I think all of us, for bo- all, both of us, that I acknowledged that there was something wrong with me and I had accepted it. And then I had, uh, you know, expressed this to my sons, you know, uh, it had a huge impact on me and my wife, you know, and, and she knew that, <clears throat> okay, he's getting after this and, and we're going to be better. You know, when you look back over everything, is there anything that you regret? I don't think so. I wish I could have been more patient and tolerant at times with people. You know, uh, I've, I've always been, had a sense of purpose, a sense of urgency and in, and in aggressiveness at accomplishing missions and getting the job done and everything. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I think uh, at times that caused me not to be as patient and tolerant as I could with some of my subordinates who were trying hard, but they, they just, whether it was lack of talent or not understanding, weren't getting after it or grasping it the way I, I was hoping they would. And then, and it caused me to kind of uh, treat them, you know, a little harsher than I should have. So if I have any regrets, it's uh, that I wish at times I could have been more patient and tolerant. I prided myself on being the example that I expected out of others. And I've, I was harder on myself. And to this day, I'm harder on myself than I ever will be hard on uh, one of my kids, grandkids or friends or, or anybody that I work with. And, uh, and I think that's the key to being a successful leader is that you hold yourself to a higher standard than you do your subordinates. And uh, if you're doing that the right way, then you're leading through your example and you've got the right amount of presence. You're doing the performance necessary to show them what right looks like. And then you're persistent at building a winning team but also managing that balance I talked about earlier between discipline and accountability and empathy and compassion that will equal efficiency and battlefield performance. So now that it's all over, let's talk about eTool Nation podcast, PME Hard Consulting. You're, you're still getting after it, even after leaving military service. Yeah, the three things I focus on now is uh, paying it forward to the current and future force, what can I do from my position as a former SEAC, 38 years in the military, I have a huge following, huge platform. What can I do to support the current force? And then paying it, or excuse me, giving back to my fellow veterans and their families. What can I do to help my fellow veterans? And that's why I do a lot with the VFW and I'm on boards and everything. And then, you know, I want to make life comfortable for my family. And when I got ready to retire, I said, hey, I'm retired, but I'm not tired. So I want to get out and take on the corporate world. So I've got a lot of ventures going on, you know, certainly the book and uh, eTool Nation and PME Hard. But also, you know, I'm, I'm going into business with other senior enlisted and I'm continuing to support other enlisted folks that are starting businesses of their own. And I'm using this hashtag corporate enlisted takeover because I want to show enlisted folks that they can do the job of enlisted person, get out of the military, and they can be very successful and prominent in the uh, corporate world. So that's kind of what I'm getting after now. It's all about giving back and paying it forward, but it's also taking care of myself and building a future for my grandchildren that my wife and I didn't have as we were growing up. Yeah, you're working with Ryan over on eTool Nation Great guy. He's doing some fantastic work all over the world. Really, really still giving back. Where can everybody find you? Because I really want them to hear your story because I I think one, the rank that you had, a lot of people don't know about that rank. They, it's a very unknown job and it's a very thankless job for what you did uh, for as long as you did it. So where can people find you, find out more about you and where can they get a hold of this book? So they can go to PMEHard.com and find out about me and my business and also order the book. And they can order, uh, I sell apparel as well for eTool Nation and my book, Surrender or Die. They can order a signed eTool if they want. They can also find the book on Amazon. 
uh, hard copy, paperback, and uh, ebook is available right now. Working on the audio book through this summer and everything. But also, I'm on social media. There's a lot of fake uh, John Wayne Troxels out there on social media, so you got to be careful. But I have verified accounts on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, Instagram is at JW Trox. Uh, Facebook is John Wayne Troxel with the blue check mark. I'm also on Twitter uh, at PME Hard Trox. And I'm also on LinkedIn, verified on LinkedIn as well. John Troxel is my name there. Uh, they can find me there. And uh, I try to talk about and showcase what I'm doing. I spend a lot of time with the troops. And so I continue to showcase what I'm doing and getting after it so I can continue to try and inspire uh, people to go out and do better or do great things, especially if they are a veteran and post-military life. Uh, I want to inspire them to go out and do great things with their life uh, as they have made their transition. All right, this is it. Any advice you want to give to people that are thinking about joining the military, people that think about retirement maybe a little too early, or people that just want to know how they should continue on with life through all these obstacles that we talk about that present themselves every day. So you got to, you have to have a positive pr approach to everything you do. And you've got to be a champion, not a victim. That means you've got to strive for excellence. And if there's something wrong that needs fixed, you've got to champion a solution to it. Don't fall prey and be a victim and say, oh, woe was me and all of this. You got to be a champion. And I will tell you this, dream big. What do you want to do in this world? Dream big. But you got to set lofty and attainable goals uh, that you can accomplish based off of who you are, what you are, what skills you have and stuff like that. Then visualize every day getting after those goals, the necessary steps you have to go through to reach that goal. And if you do all of that, then all you have to do is actualize it and go out and get it done. And that's what I recommend for a recipe for being successful in the military, successful in business, but most importantly, successful in life. So get after it and enjoy the ride along the way. Well, I got to tell you, 38 years, we covered as much as we could. I think we got a lot of it done. Guys, you know where you can find John, but let's talk about where you can find me. As always, you can find me on Instagram at the DTD underscore podcast. You can find me on Facebook at the DTD podcast, and you can find me on YouTube where all these conversations are in video form at the DTD podcast. But your one-stop shop is going to be dtdpodcast.net. John, he's going to have his own page on there. It's got pictures of him that he sent to me. It's got where you can find the book. It's got where you can hook up with eTool Nation, PME Hard Consulting, everything that you need to know about him. That's your one-stop shop. You go to his episode and click on anything you like. Now that you know everywhere you can find me, let's talk about my amazing sponsors, Mac Belts and Police Coffee. Now, we all know that nothing stands up to wear and tear like a good leather belt. If you're looking for the toughest leather belt on earth, then you've come to the right place, Mac Belts. They're handcrafted in the USA by veterans who are serious about their craft. If you're looking for a belt that's tough enough for your active lifestyle and helps support those who've given so much to our country, look no further than Mac Belts. It's the toughest belt on the planet. Right now, they have a 25% off summer clearance sale going on. Let's talk about one of their belts, the Governor. It's laser cut from premium synthetic polymer with an impressive brake strength of 1,500 pounds. It's got a 1.5 inch width and it's handmade right here in the USA by SOF veterans. Now we all know Mac that runs the company is a retired Navy SEAL and Mac belts is the highest caliber of American craftsmanship and also positively impact their military charity partners. Let's talk about coffee. If you love it, I can't go a day without waking up in the morning. Police Coffee, it's an officer-owned business that's dedicated to crafting the finest coffees and blends, and they're shipped as soon as they're made to provide you with the freshest coffee available. Each batch is roasted fresh by people who know what it means to stay vigilant. Their specialty coffees do not waste one drop when flavor is concerned, and their coffee's some of the best you'll find. But it also helps serve an important cause, and it's the one I talk about every week. 50% of their profits go towards helping family members of police officers who fell in the line of duty. And if you want flavor, I'll give you one. One Ranger. It's their newest flavored coffee that you're sure to love. It's flavorful, medium-bodied coffee with a smooth and sweet pecan flavor. 
Now, pecan coffee, it's probably one of the best combinations in the world. It's rich, sweet, nutty, buttery, and its flavor cuts right through coffee's natural acidity to give you a smooth and satisfying coffee experience. When you go to policecoffee.com, DJK10 will give you 10% off your order. Make sure you check out our sponsors, Mac Belts and Police Coffee. MacBelts.com, policecoffee.com. Guys, that's going to be it for this week. That's John. I'm DJ. This has been the show. Catch us on the next one. We'll see you later. We're out of here. Oh.